OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. Good morning, good morning, good morning. It's Thursday morning, it's OTB AM. Welcome to the show. We're here between now and 10 o'clock. As per usual, to my left this morning, I have the one and only, Galway's finest, Johnny Ward. Johnny, good morning. Uh, good morning. Good How morning. Haven't been on in a while. Good to be back. Too long, too long. And Colin Boogie is here as, you, as per usual. Morning, Colin. Shane and Johnny, good morning. Galway Cork and Monaghan represented this morning, folks. How are you keeping? Okay. Very well. Um, very well. What a game of football last weekend. Gaelic uh, football... Still amazing to watch I when did, it's good. I didn't even have to ask him mm. to bring it up, oh, and he brings up Monaghan. Folks, if you want to talk, bring it, we mightn't brought up Monaghan. It could be one of the two games. It could be the other game. You were talking Darian about Darian for a while was good. Mon- yeah, I was talking about Monaghan. If you want to talk about it for the next two hours, we can. But <laughs> feel people might get angry. The gumption to go for a goal there, like ah. you're just like, what are you thinking? Cajones I mean, just lack of experience. Put the ball over the bar, like you know, keep you know, make it level, whatever. Scenes hashtag. But then, scenes. but then I would never have had that moment of like my my soul leaving my body in mm. happiness and hugging random Monaghan people around me that I didn't know. It might it must be right up there with the annual like avoiding relegation on the last day it's kind of vibe. The usual. This team, yeah. this Monaghan team over the last fifteen years have given me so much happiness. Yeah, I, I should Look be so grateful to face. you know. Yeah. So it's it's an absolute buzz. So regardless of whether we win in All Ireland ever or not. They've given me some good days. That's lovely. So I'm going to take that, you know. you got to take that to the bank. Straight out of the Mayo kind of copy book there. Well, yeah. It's yeah. A, some people say it's a loser's attitude. I don't care. I've had I've had some serious days supporting Monaghan. And mm. that's, that's what sport's all about, isn't it? Well, if League of Ireland teams go into the Champions League or the Europa League or the Conference League, they've literally no chance to win it. That doesn't stop the enjoyment. Oh, yeah. You no pick chance. a point against a yeah. so-called heavyweight. Absolutely. I mean, you're laughing. O to BM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. We've got loads coming up between now and uh, 10 o'clock, as I said. Uh, Shane Curran and Michael Meehan will be with us from 8 o'clock the big one in the GA this weekend of course Ross Common and Galway plenty of hurling action as well we'll get to that a little bit later in the show with uh, Taggy Fogarty who'll join us uh, around 8.50 uh, Vinnie Perth at 8.20 talking League of Ireland uh, kind of semi-regular shot, uh, slot he's done with us now uh, Vinnie and plenty of interesting strands and talking points in the League of Ireland to get into with him uh, John Duggan will join us for the sports news around 8.45 as I said Taggy around 8.50 for the hurling and uh, Declan Lynch's you had to be there uh, at 10, uh, 5 past 9 and his picks are brilliant uh, very niche and very brilliant so stick with us for that there also a sign of his age you won't mind me saying because he's gone back well 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 into the 70s there which, he's dug uh, deep yeah he's dug deep um, yeah it's actually Colin sent me on the list last night it was like I'm actually looking forward to talking about these events that I wasn't asked just yeah. to see because different perspective on, on old Ireland as well it's going to be brilliant uh, we should touch on the back page of the Irish Independent this morning our good friend Dan McDonald has a piece uh, Ferguson to resist Thanks, United it's which bit of a strike. Good friend. <laughs> good friend. He's on the show, like good friend. Yeah. Colleague. Would you want to go? Yeah. To Acolyte. Acolyte. Yeah. Yeah. Subordinate. Exactly. <laughs> if you're watching Dan, Johnny loves you really. Um, Evan Ferguson is expected to commit his future to Brighton and turn down the opportunity in the short term, at least, to become the most expensive Irish footballer of all time. Manchester United reportedly waiting in the wings, uh, forty million euro plus in excess to instigate a discussion and even then there's no guarantee it will be entertained by Brighton uh, is what Dan is writing today Tottenham also keen on him being Harry Kane's long term replacement uh, mentions that he's on the radar of Man City and Chelsea as well but the Manchester United interest appears to be the, the, the strongest um, Darren Fletcher who's a technical director at United is known to be a fan of Evan Ferguson um, so unclear yeah, he's really known to be a fan of Evan Ferguson everyone's a fan of Evan Ferguson well, yes. unless you know anything about anything you're a fan of Evan but Ferguson but we love talking he's about known to be a fan of Evan Ferguson I mean like Evan Ferguson is an 18 year old footballer who's taken the world by storm in a team that's mid-ranking a decent mid-ranking team yeah. of course of course. He, I mean that's not even he's known to be a fan of like, but that, we, that we, like he, we like hearing that non-Irish people are also yeah. you know, we're still quite about insecure it. about like are, yeah. uh, about Ireland in general it's like we're still like you know the Irish Times like new to the parish Ireland is great people are very friendly and it's like the top red story uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Irish but fans it, are the best in the world yeah Evan yeah. Ferguson is great though he is fantastic. <laughs> so Brighton face United in the FA Cup semi-final at Wembley uh, next weekend. It's unclear if this ankle issue this will clear up. The which? This weekend. This weekend Sorry, this yeah. weekend. Is it? Oh yeah, so next weekend is... We've, I've had this is t- next weekend the following week? I've, I've had this debate with you. It's, it's this week, weekend. This weekend. Yeah, I, I would... I, well, oh, next yeah, weekend is the weekend of coming for me. It's like this no, the next no, one. No, 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 it's the next one. No. It's like the next weekend. No, why, it's why would this be the weekend. one after? But well, why would you... Do this weekend, what's, what's not this next weekend. What's this weekend then? 
Both the same thing. The, the both. No, I don't know. You can say next both. weekend is next sorry, week. Anyway, Matt McDonald was going to that game. Sorry, and uh, like so, he was texting me on Saturday. Uh, Ferguson, like you know, really worried emoji. And I was thinking, this he must be out for six months. Not at all. He just Dan. Isn't that match? Exactly. So Dan's trip to watch the cup game. Mm. Was it was all about Ferguson, and to be fair, like it's first world problem. Oh, like, he's Ferguson, going to Wembley. Yes, yeah, so going Ferguson's to Wembley. Grand, like yeah, it's just he's damn eating okay. caviar in the press box. Yeah, there we are. Sure, Dan, Dan, Dan will find his way to make Lap that. Well, uh, Dan's saying it's unclear if, if Ferguson will be fit to play Man United in the league yeah. on the fourth of May, let alone the Which this weekend. After. So it did like a, a OTB Saturday now is just like if especially because the Brighton Chelsea game was actually on, so it was like Ferguson watching. Oh. Anytime he's even anytime he sneezes, we're injured. Yeah. Are, we're, can we're, we're, we're can you both injured. remember uh, when he was really highly rated before he kicked the ball, uh, kicked the senior football? Was he? Did we talk about him like he was the next big thing? Yeah, See, I'm forgetting about it now because he has delivered, and we've when seen so many Vinny, examples. Vinny, Vinny will definitely be a better verse to talk about that. Vinny's very good friends, his dad as well, and he was because when he was, he was. But you just can't put that much pressure on a 14 year old because most of the time it goes wrong. Or a 15 mm. year old, and it, it predated him playing for Bowles against Chelsea at 14 mm. because he was so big. And we spoke to Keith Ward on our podcast this week, and he said. Ferguson could do the basics straight away and he said you can't underestimate that he could keep a ball trap it and pass it to the wing at 14 that's an interesting point Keith Tracy was on uh, last week and mm. he was saying that I think we were even saying it off air and he's definitely said it on air before it's like you'd be surprised the amount of top level footballers who can't do what you just said Johnny like real basic stuff like get the ball pass the ball keep the ball run mm. and like you say Ferguson does the basics really really well Tracy world, world class though. basics good football brain I'd say is the, is the so did Keith right. Tracy that that man could play ball. Yeah, could yeah. Play. couldn't he? So I almost and, forget. Like, uh, I actually uh, typed him in on YouTube when he was next to me to see if I could find any highlights, but I couldn't find anything of him. But so I do I'm remember playing, him being a, a fantastic So I'm playing for player. Pats, like he was well overweight. He won't mind me admitting at the time in Europe um, against a decent team, and he was still running the show. He said it this last week. Yeah. He said he was in he was in Fat Club. Mm. Like he he, he, he did. That you had to be there last week. Well, wow. and it was it was very good. Now you would enjoy you would have enjoyed mm. that. Now I mean you enjoyed today's one as well. And look, the other thing as well is that we had loads of talking points for this morning. All football, like we had the WSL last night, Manchester United about to win the league, the Champions League, and this goes to show Ferguson's impact. We read this story and we're like, put him up to the top. It's, it's it has to be done. like and we had Irish scores last night. I should mention Adam Ida scored for Norwich away in a one-all draw at QPR, and a couple of Irish uh, scores for Preston as well. Albeit they lost four-two away to Swansea. Tom Cannon and Troy Parrott both in the score sheet, yeah. which is positive. I think Ryan Manning set up one of the goals and it does look like just reading during the week it does look like he is going to depart and um, Russell Martin just seems a massive fan of Ryan Manning and um, it'll be interesting to see if Stephen Kenny brings him back in or where he is in the Ireland setup. but the, 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 the Ferguson one for me Bowes are obviously just waiting and I presume St Kevin's as well are waiting to see what happens here mm-hmm. because like potentially if, if I, my figures are right Bowes could be on the cusp of making about 10 million from an Evan Ferguson move because yeah. I think if, if you were saying call him the figure in dance face was 40 million like does, he's worth yeah. far more than that I mean let's be honest like he's he's not even physically there yet um, and his performances considering his inexperience I'm not sure like is Evan Ferguson like I don't like anyone comparing him to Erling Haaland because that's ridiculous <laughs> but he's worth a lot more than 40 million well Kian Rowe was messaged in on the YouTube and please keep the comments coming in on the show this morning he says resident Dubai listener lads morning Kian or what time is it in Dubai it's, they're ahead of us aren't they yeah it'd be about um, four hours this. heading for the uh, early afternoon I suppose uh, in today's inflated market with a lack of old school number nines what does Ferguson sell for 80 million-ish is not tough to imagine it's it's funny he says old school there's a lot of old school in him but um, he's touches like I, I actually would I think I think um, from watching both of them this season, whatever I've seen, I think Ferguson's probably a better player outside the box than Haaland. I think his touches are actually better. Yeah. Um, Haaland has pace that Ferguson probably would never have. That's the one thing. But but he's an old school number nine. But he's so much so much quality to his game. I think as well outside the box and really intelligent and makes 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 runs that look simple but aren't. I think the thing I got gathered from Evan when I interviewed him uh, at the end of last year was. He has a confidence that just belies his age. He's like, it's almost like an arrogance. Still, the way in, in interviews, Erling Haaland definitely has an arrogance, mm. which which he maybe need to be that good. Evan is is just on the precipice of of having that arrogance, and, and you can sense that the more interviews he does and the more he plays first team football, he, that arrogance and confidence is going to be a um, on the increase, and that's a good thing. You know, I want to be, I want to be hearing Evan Ferguson in interviews 
being aggressive and, and arrogant and cocky that he should be. He's a, he's, a, he's a number nine in the Premier League. That's not the Irish thing to do, though. Not, well, that's the thing. No, it's not. But, but I, I, no one would blame him because he's a top talent. No, I I think uh, his dad Barry seems to have, um, and his his mother whose name I don't know. Uh, apologies, I only know Barry's name because obviously he played in the League of Ireland and that a uh, good friend of Vinny's. But um, I think they've obviously done an amazing job. Um, they're a very sporting family, but. He he's almost been raised. Sarah is the mother. Sarah. So Sarah and Barry have almost, I would say, raised Evan with a view to being a professional footballer. Mm. And they probably, at a very early age, said most kids want to be a professional footballer. It's odds on that Evan will be good enough to at least play as a professional footballer at some level. Let's raise him accordingly and see what happens with the physique that he has. He has the pedigree to be a footballer from, um, you know, his dad's background as well, and. He's probably almost been single-minded with that goal in mind and he's just improved and improved and improved. And I think the tutelage that he had at Kevin's and Bowes, I think for Bowes to put him in a game against Chelsea at 14, I mean, if anything goes wrong there, there it'll be all over like Joe Duffy and it'll be like, why are you playing a 14-year-old? It'll be all over the papers. But they knew what they were doing with him. Yeah. And so did Barry. Uh, a few more comments coming in. Uh, did you check out the Eclipse, Shane? Pink Floyd had some live stream covering it while playing Dark Side in its entirety. Got up for it. You see, the Total Solar Eclipse was the Australian outback got the best part. So I didn't quite make it. I'm actually going to go over to America. There's a mass, there's a Total Solar Eclipse coming across the United States in 2024. Going to go over and see it. Of course, cover your eyes, folks, and, and don't look directly at the sun. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a slight um, departure from Singing the sport this it. morning. Singing Georgie it. Kelly also scored for Rotherham last night. If he stays fit next season, he'll score a lot of goals. That's from Edward. That was actually Tuesday night. Two nights game. ago, yeah. yeah. A lot of our scores. Yeah, like yeah, encouraging. Scores. Cannon as well seems to be really... Um, I haven't seen him play. It seems to be really creating waves. And I think... Um, I think Stephen Kenny will be very encouraged by the, those three guys scoring goals. They're all on the periphery of, of the... Uh, of Evan Ferguson's position, oh, I yeah. suppose, at the moment. The uh, WSL, you mentioned a column uh, last night. Manchester United beating Arsenal by a goal to nail Alessia Russo with a goal. Mm-hmm. Lovely assist as well from Nikita Paris. If you watch that goal back, she moves down the right hand flank and Good pull had back, a bit, yeah. bit of composure to kind of pull the ball back and, and keep the, the heads up football to uh, spot Russo in the middle. United now top of the WSL on 44 points from 18 matches. Chelsea on 40 points. Four points well off them with uh, 16 games. So they have two games in hand, mm. Chelsea. Arsenal in third on 38 points from 17 games. Kind of looking like a United-Chelsea title battle. United have never won the WSL, but top three finish in Champions League football for next season is probably um, number one priority. If they can win a league, that would be brilliant. Um, but a, a concerning injury for Leah Williamson as well. Big time, yeah. That's the, that's the big story. Yeah, last night, 12 minutes on the clock and England captain went down injured and straight away... A gesture that it was something significant and Arsenal are having an injury crisis and like our own Katie McCabe she was suspended last night but they have also other injuries like Kim Little and uh, Vivian Miedema um, Beth and, Mead, like, yeah. and Beth Mead and like Williamson was only playing in midfield because of this injury crisis and now she's gone as well so Arsenal are kind of fast emerging as the kind of crisis story of the WSL whereas Manchester United are the, the team on the up and look like they're going to win the league and our own Aoife Mannion she played last night as well for United so yeah. that's another good Irish angle and also the other game last night, Brighton beat Everton 3-2. Megan Connolly played the full game for Brighton and uh, Courtney Brasden in goal for Everton too. So less than 100 days out for the World Cup. Concerning for England. Is that good news for Ireland? I suppose we're not in the same group. I don't be begrudging them too much. I think they have Haiti, Denmark and China in their group, England. Um, but they yeah, might rally as a result. That's the thing. This is it. But yeah. it's funny in the World Cup year, you, you're like constantly watching Irish players in, in, in matches and going, just mm. don't get injured. Yeah, That's like, as you say, Evan Ferguson on a Saturday. We almost get obsessed when we when we realise we have a talented bunch of players that we're like, please don't get injured. And people making point in the in the comments, um, you know, because he's a big man, Ferguson is, does that make him more prone to injury? I don't know, um, and but but what I do know is that we're watching Evan and we're watching all these Irish players in the WSL as as well ahead of the World Cup with a little bit of nervousness and tension. You can't enjoy it. Yeah, at the same time though, they can't play like that. No, of course. Like, they have to play like a Kenny training session and just like go heather and tongs, uh, hammer and tongs. And uh, yeah, we're probably, I don't think we need to worry necessarily much about England in terms of um, England to be like just a little bit a, a step ahead of us at the moment. Oh yeah, for sure. That's what I mean things. about it. Right. Um, but yeah, it's 100 days, yeah. So like this will come upon us very quickly. Now. Oh yeah, a good deal uh, less. But like we are on McCabe watch, aren't we? Mm. For the, for those, yeah. I mean, she recovered from that injury remarkably fast after the Bayern uh, collapse which like remember the concern the next morning after that. <laughs> but like we'll take a suspension all day and as Emma Carroll said beforehand you wish she was suspended for a lot of the rest of the season so <laughs> she's uh, good to go for the World Cup but at the same time like 
like you said, Johnny, you kind of need match sharpness and match fitness Absolutely. and take the risk, like take the risk of this injury oh, and play sure. high intensity football. Because you saw the the World Cup at the end of last year, it actually benefited like the mm. games, like, like that World Cup final. You'd forget it's one of the great finals mm. in sporting history. Mm. Remember that, James? and I feel like I really do strongly feel that because it was like a quarter of way into the domestic season. The mm. players were good to go. Uh, yeah, it's, absolutely. Uh, it's certainly something we'll be keeping an eye on. Denise O'Sullivan, Emma Carroll points out for us. Denise O'Sullivan scored a screamer last night as well. So we're yeah, we're big time on Irish uh, player watch at the moment. Um, Champions League action last night. It's funny. Like ordinarily, if there was a Champions League quarter final second leg, we'd be straight trying to get to it at the top of the show. But it's just it hasn't really materialised that the Champions League last yet this year. Now I'm looking forward to the to the Man City Real Madrid game and and the Milan derby and the other semi final as well. But it just feels like the quarter finals. Maybe didn't light up the way we, we had hoped. Everyone was eyeing up this City Bayern game as going to be a cracker, but 4 1 in aggregate and quite comfortable last night for City. I, I, think, I think Frank Lampard getting the job, um, I don't think it, it helped Chelsea's chance of turnaround. Like, I don't think Real Madrid are actually really that good. Like, they're. Really? They're, they're an amazing, no, but you can get at them. Like, you can. I mean, Man City, if Man City don't win the Champions League now, Pep shouldn't nearly give up. Like, this is. They, they've, man, they've Real Madrid to beat, and Real Madrid have very good players, but they're still very reliant on two lads, essentially in their mid to late 30s. Like, and they do cough up chances. Like, Chelsea should have scored. Two or three, really, on Tuesday night, mm. um, and Chelsea are no good at the moment. Like they, okay, they put in a, a good shift, but they, um, I think, if if they'd stayed loyal um, to the manager and just given him a bit of a chance, because they 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 weren't playing badly in Europe, and they gave themselves a chance at two 0 get the first goal. But Lampard, I don't think he's inspiring confidence in the players. Mm. Um, for me, I, I I I felt once they conceded, the game was over. They had no real confidence in front of goal. The game last night was kind of I think that was gone. Um, Sane, if Sane scores that, chance I thought the first half was very good. Yeah, if very, Sane very scores, good. I think Man City needed a Bayern goal like to. It did, but Man like, City are probably still a little mentally brittle because they've had so many of these bad experiences yeah. in the Champions League. One nil would have made it interesting. Um, again, the the VAR and the penalties. I mean that. Sorry, that Bayern penalty decision is. Yeah, but the Man City one was nearly worse. Like, it's like that's just not a penalty. I mean, you can't like you're doing all you can not to handle the ball, and then like it's just natural thing that his his hand half moves, and it's never a penalty. And it's anyway. And then I'll, I'll, is it just me, or is the the obsession with handball in mm. the penalty area a modern? Oh, it's taken off a modern thing because I don't remember are. if you want. Yeah, even bef- just before VAR came out, because like any time there's any uh, ball delivered, kind of midriff area. You get everyone claiming for a penalty if it hits the opposition anywhere in the body, right? And if you watch games back from 10 to 20 years ago, I don't think it was as prevalent. No, I could be wrong, like, but I feel like it's increasing by each season. It's, there is an absolute obsession mm. with handball. I, I, th- I think it's, it's one of the most stupid rules, honestly. In, if, you, if, if you're anyway playing in a position and trying to make a tackle, your hands are going to move. It's you should be allowed to pick the ball up. Is that what you're saying, Johnny? You should be allowed to handle the ball by not, when you don't intend to handle the ball. And well, they I, do the Liam Gallagher pause is the only way to get out of it. Like, like don't, don't put your hands out like that. Footballers are very good at deceiving so they can make it look like they did not If you use your hands Vinnie Perth might talk about this because Dundalk were really cruelly denied in 2016 by when they played leggy at home it was 1-0 in Lansdowne Road and this ridiculous penalty was given against Andy Boyle for his hands that were effectively behind his back falling on the ground like a terrible terrible decision and we, we, there's a lot of controversy about referees at the moment you can't give handball you don't understand the game if you don't realise that players when they're moving and flailing to stop across as you do don't give a handball for that and the, the handballs that were given the handball that Haaland for that penalty that is the most stupid stupid yeah. penalty ever but it was probably now a penalty in the rules well, of the there game is, so you say uh, you don't own a game if you're giving penalties like that but the problem is there's a written rule for the handball mm. so they mm. have to clarify it it's in stupid. the rules it's, right? It's so absolutely stupid. last night watching the replay of the Ilkay Gundogan shot that hits the Upa Meccano right? and I'm thinking at the time I was like oh that's not a penalty saw the replay and what I was saying to myself out loud was like, oh, that's ridiculous. But it's a penalty. Ellipsis, but he had to give it. Yeah. Because it hit his arm. And so the, if so, if the, if the re- yeah, but if the ref doesn't give it, that oh, oh yeah, but that, sure, that that's, was, not, that's, that's not last night's ref's fault. Yeah. So like the ref last night is like, I have to give this because he's handled yeah. it. Yeah. But the handball made absolutely no difference, really, to the trajectory of the shot. Mm. Like, the key, Summer was going to save that Gundogan shot, like unless it was a Tim Flowers-style howler from back in the day. Hmm. <laughs> he was going to catch that ball. So... Hitting it in Upa arm didn't actually affect the outcome of the ball, which is really what a handball should be if it affects the outcome of where it's going. But yeah. you can't write that down because no, that's, a, a, that's a huge grey area. A handball should be, if, I, if there was no intention of me <coughs> handing the ball and I more or less did my best not to have my hands in an unnatural position, it's not a handball. That was the rule back in the day and that was, that was yeah. quite... You're talking about a split second from the ball being hit to hitting his hand and then they showed in slow motion and his hands vaguely move. 
purely natural and he's doing everything he can he's doing everything he can not to handle the ball and his hands purely naturally move a little bit it hits his hand that's never a penalty if, if you know anything about football yet it is a penalty it is a penalty whichever, that's ridiculous how, whichever, whichever, how, how, how could you write that rule how could you mm. concisely write the rule that you're the old rule was like if there's no intention it's not a handball it's yeah, but how do you how do you uh, deem what intention is it, that's up to the discretion of the referee and hey why don't we let the referees actually call the game Johnny uh, get like off the, the fence days. get off the fence oh, the handball thing is just oh. ridi- it's so ridiculous and Vinny Vinny's, Vinny should be able to recall that because if Dundalk had gone into Warsaw 1-0 down yeah. as they should have they were 1-0 up with 10 men One that would have been one all with 20 minutes to go like that was one of the most stupid handballs remember Lee Carsley was against Turkey back in the day <laughs> another one it was like ah <laughs> Not well, uh, uh, the like West Ham had an absolutely crucial win there the other week away to Fulham 1 0. Yeah. And the build up was a handball by Sufal, mm. the right back. So that's like, you arguably say they've a Moises job, you know, those mm. little things. But for, like, for that instance, that for me was a clear handball and a free out to Fulham because his handball changed the direction of the ball. So it changed the play. And therefore, if his arm wasn't there, the ball would have continued behind but him. Your arm is there, like so. If you want to like tie people's hands behind their backs, but you can't handle like that, it. That's fine. You can't handle it. But your, your so arms are there. So if it if it affects where the ball is going, if it changes the direction of the ball, then it has to. Then be it has, that's you should be penalised for that. No. My my opinion about Upa Meccano last night was it made no difference. Mm. So I was like this, but he had to give Go it because his arm was out. Go rules where it was if you didn't intend to handle the ball, it's not a handball. Simple as that. If the ball hammers me in the head, I didn't intend to be knocked out. Why, do you, why like. do you think they changed the rules? I don't know. I mean, they have a lot of stupid rules now. I don't know. Like There had to be a reason for it. Um, because there was too many handballs that were not being penalised that were, that were affecting the, the results of the yeah, game. No, but if, if, if the ref has the discretion, he actually kind of knew what he was doing there, and it's debatable, that's fine, because ref, we're going to have debatable decisions. But you can't be handling the ball on the basis of a split second hitting his hand when he was trying not to handle it. Also, the frustrating thing he about this is that... He was literally trying not to handle the ball. The, the rules are so strict, right, that almost every top-level game now, the big talking point the next day is a decision mm. or a non-decision. And you, it seems to me it's increasingly rare that you're talking about a tactical nuance in yeah. the game and you're really like, oh, this big decision that changed the game. Kick-based, so Open like. Meccano, a uh, straight red card that was ruled out for offsides. Mm. So that was delayed. By the so way, Open Meccano thing, has forgotten how to play football over those two legs. Yeah. He just didn't have yeah. It was the it. Ireland game really, really affected ah, him. Yeah. Ferguson <laughs> messed him up. And, <laughs> and then that, so the handball decision is another one. And then Sherbine get a penalty, like you said, Johnny, at the end of the year, like, okay, that's another decision. So that's the big thing, the decisions. But really, we should talk about the back and forth in the first half. Sorry. Where Bayern really had a go and were destroying Man City in the flanks. We do have a couple of comments. Backs, they couldn't deal with it. We have a couple of comments on the handball issue. 91 Devo says, agrees with you, Johnny. These wishy, wishy-washy handball calls are ruining the game. Both calls last night were a joke. Uh, Bobby Dwyer, and I kind of agree with Bobby here, he says, the referee has to ask himself, do I think the defender is deliberately trying to gain an advantage by handling the ball? There's always going to be subjectivity and ambiguity about it, which is fair. Shane, that, uh, that straight was, jacket that for all old, players, says Pete. That was the old rule. It was like, if you didn't intend to handle it, it wasn't a handball. And it was very, very simple. And 90% of the time, there was no intention. Now, you can't block a cross going like this, right? Mm. But if you block a cross like this and you're trying to keep your hands, it's not a handball. And these things, and then they showed in slow motion. And it's like, nothing happens in slow motion, by the way. It did not happen in slow motion now it now it technically it's a handball it's a stupid rule made up by people who don't understand the game like what they do they, they like if you're leaving up the discretion of the referee then you're basically like you're exposing the ref so they can get huge Great. abuse right no, they, but you're that's, exposed, that's why, that's but they're doing it to, to they're, they're almost protecting the referees it's like this referees, is the rule just follow hey, that rule referees like making decisions that's why they became referees they didn't become referees to <laughs> defer to var do you know what I mean? Referees like to make decisions. That's why they're doing their job. I and if they get it wrong, they get it wrong. I think they like to be seen to be consistent like, and fair. They like keeping rather than making decisions. But, but decisions will be subjective, and that's why we're here talking about them. But Not this stupid handball rule. I would say there's no. I'd say there's no writing in the rules of football that it's up to the discretion of the referee anymore. Almost, mm. almost none. Mm. Uh, the subjectivity has to be outlawed in the new rules. I'd imagine. Aside from, especially the, if you live in a VAR world. Aside from the handball issue, right? Haaland takes the goal very well. He mi- ha- right by a collector's edition, by the way. Haaland missing a penalty. Yeah, because was it the first and thirteen? Was it? It, it took about four and a half minutes for the penalty to be taken, yeah. mm. and uh, Goretzka got away with some mm. nice shit re- by saying to the ref, "Oh, did you see that little object that. there?" It was like, "So why would he care about that?" Yeah. And the ref was like, "Oh yeah, cool, thanks for that, nice <laughs> one." What a move! What a move! They were a little why bit rattled in the first object? half. That, that's the thing, and I do wonder. Can Real just do them again and get at them mentally? Because City should win this game. Simple as they're better players. They have better. Um, they've Haaland, but I'm I'm still not sure. A man once told me I once interviewed a man called Captain Gene Cernan, who's a hero of mine, last man to walk on the moon. 
back to space. I remember that, yeah. Uh, literally have a quote of his tattoo. The moon we? belongs to America. It does. We're talking yeah. about uh, Jessica Harrington, moon later on, but we'll get to that. Uh, terrible segue. But Moon with an E. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, essentially, this man told me, he was trying to describe it, the fact that, you know, I, 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 people look at me differently because I walked on the moon. and this, But, but they don't realise I bleed when I cut myself. I put my trousers on one leg at a time. And that's what I was thinking when Haaland blazed the penalty over last night. I was like, oh... You he, thought of the he's actually. The I moon. thought of that quote. I was like, "He is actually human." Mm. Haaland bleeds when he cuts himself, just like us. He uh, puts his trousers on one leg at a time. Do you know he is actually not a robot? But forty-eight goals this season. Forty-eight goals. Channeling but, but still, his, uh, he can miss penalties. Channeling is Luke Davenport. Do you get the mm. reference? I don't get the reference. Please, just, please explain. Do you get the reference? No. Harchester United in Dream Team signed Luke Davenport, and I think he scored about fifteen goals in his first five games. Then his eye fell out. And he had to retire from football. And Haaland's the best thing since Davenport. I wow. think that is a great reference point, Harchester United, for the game that was in, on in Talca Park. Oh, yeah. The same day as Shamrock Rovers were playing bows in what is the biggest Irish, uh, certainly the biggest derby in the Republic of Ireland, and there were more at the Harchester game in Talca than went to watch bows and Rovers, which was probably the nadir for the League of Ireland compared to the, if not utopia, um, the way it is now, which is certainly the best buzz it's been since I started supporting it. Mm. Someone says it took less than two minutes for Johnny Ward to mention League of Ireland. No, no that, that's the first mention, is it? Well, we have a League of minutes. Ireland uh, slot, League of Ireland slot this morning I mean, as well, if any person. And there's happening, happening deservedly so. Yeah. Also, I'm just going to um, set this up for the Vinny chat Please when do. Vinny comes in. But uh, We were talking pre-show and the word cool was used to describe the League of Ireland now. And so we had a bit of a debate about when exactly it became cool to support the League of Ireland. Some people thought it was quite a while ago. Some people thought it was more recent. But it does feel like it is kind of the place to be increasingly. And there is a nice association, increasingly so, in my opinion, with the League of Ireland. There is. Jonathan Gabay was brought over to... Why is that, is the question, I suppose. Why is that? Uh, A journalist rang me from this parish, actually, uh, to get a quote on that yesterday. I don't really have the answer. I think there are a myriad of issues, but partly I think it is because it's not the Premier League. It's not... It's, we don't have like state owned teams beating each other. Do you think that's what it is? That people uh, are it's becoming disillusioned partners. with the. And we, we've come out of the pandemic in a great. The four things I would say. I don't are, think that's it. I don't, I don't well, think I, I, I think I'd be interested to hear. How, how can I relate to Newcastle beating um, Manchester City? Yeah, but if you're, well, a, what, if you're what, an Irish uh, Newcastle fan in the 80s and 90s, you're still a Newcastle fan. What today. are your four mm. things there, Johnny? The four things for me are um, social media has been massive. Uh-huh. Like the social media, you're bombarded with League of Ireland stuff on social media every day now, whether you like Brilliant, it or not. Yeah. If you're in that circle, all for free. I, I have a love relationship with social media, but it's been amazing with the League of Ireland. Um, the underage teams coming in, right? So if you have 14s, 15s, 17s, 19s, that's about 100 people straight away who are now involved in the club. They have boyfriends, girlfriends, they have parents, they have friends that are in, in necessarily now talking about the League of Ireland. A lot of them are going to games. You have the women's leg of it coming in, which has become massive as well, more or less a broader part of what. I was saying Brexit and all these young players playing in it has made it really interesting and you know what the, 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 the last thing is maybe the most important thing is it's bloody good standard and it's very good to watch at times now it's really like every game in the Premier Division is very watchable the standard of the game between Shells and Shamrock Rovers was sensational at times last Friday like yeah. and yeah. anyone who watched that game would have been proud to say that um, they were at that game I, well, it's good I watched I, it it was good yeah. I don't feel like the rise in the League of Ireland has to do with um, Irish fans of English teams getting disillusioned with you don't, state takeovers. You don't think so? or, uh, not no, a chance. No, really? not, not so much not that, but it's like young people have, have options now of maybe going to a League of Garden game or, or, or being overly invested in an English team. And I'm not sure I'm not sure they are as much anymore. A lot of people maybe are, I'm wrong. There's a lot of people now I find, people who are who follow teams over in England who now follow League of Ireland teams as well. And yeah. they, look, you don't have to they're not mutually exclusive. You can you can support the League of Ireland and still go over to England and yeah. watch Liverpool or Manchester United or Celtic or wh- whoever. Like th- people seem to feel there seems to be this split that's like you have to pick one. You have to pick one. You and can't there, support there Man United really, and Pats. There isn't really any more like. Yeah. I don't think like not well. The League, of Ireland, like to think the League of Ireland fans aren't as insecure as they were as well in that like um I I just think now so many people are going to games. There are people putting stuff on Instagram that I know last Friday at the Bowes game I was like I didn't I can't believe A that you're at League of Ireland game and B that you're promoting the fact you're at League of Ireland game on social media it has it has become cool 
Do, uh, do you think there is an increase in interest in the League of Ireland? Oh, would sure. you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. And why would you disagree that it is a disillusionment with the yeah, yeah. Uh, the game abroad? I just don't, I don't think there's any. What, you, what do you think? In other words, what do you think the reason is for the increase in interest? It is. It's. It's. Everyone can see the League of Ireland now. It's. It's on TV more. The attendances are up. The ticket. Not on I think, TV that much. No, but th- I think that I think it's been as you said, Johnny. It's been promoted. Social media is where we're all seeing it. Like social media, it has become the cool thing. I, you're, I'm I, like I kind of live. Where I am in Smithfield is probably halfway between Bows and Pats, and my housemates are and, and me are like, oh, we have to. Who are we gonna pick? Do you know? But it's like cause you, <laughs> you just have, you go to the nearest team. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Like I obviously can't support Monaghan United anymore in the League of Ireland. Unfortunately, um, are you a ball boy in Gort Keegan back. I was back in the day. Yeah. See yeah, the, yeah. the next step for the League of Ireland column is the like of Monaghan United coming back and being given the. Um, financial incentives from the league which don't exist at the moment to come back because it still makes mm. very little sense for a first division club Kerry are doing an amazing job but the pitfalls are huge we need Monaghan Kilkenny we need teams in Cavan Port Leash Mayo we need teams to make it a genuine national league because it still isn't and I think that's the next step as well as obviously um, facilities yeah we'll 100% uh, get to more of that with any purse because it's an interesting conversation like uh, the, the standard is good Shane that's the main yeah. thing if you bring somebody like when I, when I was a League of Ireland fan initially it was it was hard to sell it because if you watch the game on TV particularly relative to a Premier League game at the time it was shite like let's be honest it was poor it was hard to watch it just isn't now but all it's also, the teams are playing football it's also having names like Damien Duff managing teams 100% that's like, another thing the coaching levels I think are outstanding like 100% really good and and the other thing Colm these these coaches are in Ireland now they're not in England the jobs just aren't there in England they're not even in the they're not like Stephen Bradley could have gotten the Lincoln job but other than that they're not even li- listed in, as, as being potential and now you have Stephen O'Donnell Stephen Bradley Damien Duff Colin Healy um, Rory Higgins Stephen O'Donnell Tim Clancy all these young managers in the League of Ireland yeah, and I do agree with your point that you've made before Johnny you're, where you're saying you know there have to be more teams teams in Mayo teams in Monaghan teams in Tip counties and areas that don't necessarily are, are not represented necessarily by League of Ireland teams and for young kids Shane if yeah, you, 100%. say if you if, if young Shane Hannan is like now, if not going to become the next Evan Ferguson, he's the Evan Ferguson of I tried of, my best. Of, yeah, if you're the Evan Ferguson of County Monaghan, right? You need like you need to go beyond Monaghan Town and say I need to play underage level now. And I think Monaghan Cavan, I think there might be a team up there, but I need a good underage system to bring me to the next level in my locality rather than having to go to Dublin like the old days. Yeah, it's 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 geography, isn't it? Because everyone people were saying to me, oh, sure, when Monaghan United finished up, ah, oh, sure, go and sport and dock. But I was like, I was like, Dundalk were literally Monaghan's closest rivals. Yeah, yeah. So you can't do that. Yeah. Do you know, like, and I, and I, but I do watch Dundalk matches now and wish them all the best and, and actually hope that they do well. But it's not like you can move to the near next. It's not like a, you know, a Bose fan is going to go and support Pats or Rovers if Bose went out of existence. That just that's not the way it works. We we, we were in for time immemorial in this country. We were generally indoctrinated and brought up in the Catholic Church. And we just went to mass and didn't think about it. Right? It's the same with Gaelic games. Right? We're brought up, and this county thing is is completely enshrined in our head. I'm from Galway, and I'm never going to support like Mayo, Sligo, Roscommon. That's fair enough, though. So and that does seep into like League of Ireland mindset. And if you're from say if you're from Mayo, it's just hard for Mayo people to support Galway United because they hate Galway in football. So why would I? Support yeah. and that's completely natural it's not natural for you to want to support Dundalk if you used to go to Monaghan United games yeah. sorry that's not natural at all they were our rivals exactly. I want to support a Monaghan United team back in the League of Ireland 100% with Monaghan players yeah and that's the way to look at it uh, listen we'll get back into this with uh, with Vinnie Perth as we said he'll be in with us uh, in around 20, 20 minutes time or so we're going to uh, get to Gaelic games after the break with uh, Shane Curran and Michael Meehan big game in the Connacht Senior Football Championship semi-final to look forward to this weekend it's at the Hyde Roscommon versus Galway uh, during the ads though first a clip from the latest episode of the Hurling Pod where listeners laid down a challenge to All-Ireland winners Paul Murphy and James Skell to pick the five best players in the country the Hurling Pod with Board Gosh Energy proud sponsors of the Senior Hurling Championship and the Legends Tour Series taking place in Croke Park back in a sec OTB AM The Sports Breakfast Show from Off The Ball Off The Ball will be hosting a live UEFA Champions League roadshow in partnership with Just Eat and it's coming your way on May 3rd live from the Mansion House in Dublin We'll be joined by some great guests, including UEFA Champions League winner, John O'Shea. Our guests will share memorable stories and reminisce about their careers. We'll also look ahead to the latter stages of the competition. This is an exclusive off-air event and tickets are limited, so don't delay. Go to offtheball.com forward slash events and we'll see you on the night. Just Eat, the official food delivery partner of the UEFA Champions League. 
<laughs> I'm going to say this now, right? Cahill Mannion, but go on, right? I'm just no, going to say. No, would you believe I haven't got a goal for them in it? Okay, okay. Yeah. I just thought you would go for Cahill Mannion. But okay. I thought it was going to be like Cahill Mannion, Connor Whelan. Yeah, yeah. The, retur- I, the returning joint. I, 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 <laughs> I have a bolter as well. Oh, I love the ball. It sounds terrible when it, and it's a Kikini player and it didn't come for the Kikini man. But if you were saying top five players in the country and you were saying it's a bolter, are you not already undermining the fact that no, you're saying I, he's a bolter? I, I love it. I, if I okay, was going to I love this out of my team. I want Owen Cody in my team. Oh, yeah. 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 I, still, I, I do think he's one of the top five. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. I'm just so torn the last one. I have Keen Lynch. I have Kyle Hayes. I have Tony Kelly. I have Owen, K- Owen Cody. And then I, I have like Hugh Murphy, I have Barry Nash and I have TJ Reid. I had Cahill Mannion as an option, don't get me wrong. <laughs> so please excuse me for that one. Right. If you, tell you, if you think Cahill Mannion is in the top five in the country, put him in there. Yeah, yeah. this is your top five. But you go with five now because you have to name an eight pairs now. That's it. Cahill it's tough though. Yeah. Cahill Mannion's going in. He's going in? <laughs> He's going in. Is he? Sorry, screw the lottie. Cahill Mannion's going in. He's going in. So who's the five? Who's the five? Keen Lynch, Kyle Hayes, Tony Kelly, Owen Cody, Cahill Mannion. Now, I'd be a bad host if I didn't say at that point that screw ye, he's going in as justification. Give us a bit more. Why are you putting Carl Mannion in there ahead of the likes of Burns and Gary? Yeah, Hegarty? look, look at, when you're in a top class team, I, I and I mean this with respect, it probably is nearly easier to look top class. Okay, okay? I'm not saying every other guy is top class. So I'm just saying that Key Lynch, I think, is a Rolls Royce player. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. And then behind him is Kyle Hayes, an athletic freak who can play anywhere. And I also think that if you put Keane Lynch back into the same, he'd be as influential for you. I just think he's that good with those two guys. Tony Kelly, admittedly, I left him out last year, um, but he is in the top five, <laughs> so admittedly. Owen Cody, I just, I don't know, there's something about him. Strong, bold, you know what I mean, direct, win his own ball, likes high ball, likes low ball, can take it on. I just think he's going to be, like, he's top class for me. Uh, yeah. I, I'd, I'd have him in any team in the country, to be honest. OCB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. Six minutes past the end on this Thursday morning's OTB AM with myself and uh, Johnny Ward. It's time to talk Gaelic games because a huge weekend in the Connacht Senior Football Championship. We've got both semi finals Sligo and New York, of course, on Saturday. And then we've got Galway against Ross Common in the Hyde on Sunday afternoon. Delighted to be joined by the former Ross Common goalkeeper Shane Curran and the former Galway sharpshooter Michael Meehan on the show this morning. Morning, lads, how are things? Good, Shane. Good morning. Good morning, uh, good morning fellas. Good morning, Michael. How are you? Hi, Thanks for joining us, lads. Uh, we, we, we just wanted to briefly get touch the, on get there. the pleasantries out of the, the way. Pleasantries out of the way. Yeah, yeah. It was very, 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 very coerced out of the lads. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. We we'll get the boxing gloves on now in a yeah. second. Uh, first of Sligo, Sligo winning the uh, Connacht Under Twenty Football Championship, defending their title last night in Chum. Uh, lads scoring the last few points of the match to to nick it by a point, fourteen points to thirteen over Galway. Points scored deep into injury time from Dylan Walsh. Heartbreak for Galway and uh, Michael. It's it's changing the shape of of Connacht football possibly over the next few years. Is it? Yeah, to be fair to Sligo, they've um, they've had a lot of success this year already at underage with their schools, Summerhill, making the Home Cup final. And and again, last night, now I didn't get to see it, I was training underage girls myself at, at home with my own little one. But, um, you know, I suppose if you think back to their senior success at provincial level over the years, that was just kind of... Hither and thither. Um, now they're sort of building something maybe from, from the bottom up. Um, so, yeah, they seem to be going about things the right way. So the the rest of us have to kind of keep an eye on things. That said, you know, Galway have been very successful and very competitive at this level for a number of years. Um, and Roscommon in bit as well have, have been in and out of it there. So it's good to see Connacht teams typically when they get into the All-Iron Series uh, at under 20 level can represent uh, the province very well so we, we wish them well at this stage the, these underage girls by the way are, they, are you like an, an absolute icon or do, do they even uh, remember you playing t- <laughs> oh geez, no this is my daughter's team here uh, under 6, 7 and 8 in, in Caltra Johnny up you're just some owl then embarrassing dad that, yeah. absolutely yeah <laughs> embarrassing dad <laughs> hashtag embarrassing dad yeah. yeah you know but it's got to be done I suppose uh, it's got to be done for sure and and uh, listen uh, keep, keep a lit with that as well because uh, the future yeah. is bright no doubt in Caltra um, we should get into the, the game this weekend lads on Sunday and, and look Sligo fans might think of New York fans as well that we're bypassing them but uh, realistically we do want to focus on, on the Galway Roscommon match at the Hyde on uh, on Sunday afternoon um, Shane Roscommon's last championship win over Galway in the Hyde 1990 so it's uh, it's been a while 
it's, it's quite quite a time ago. Um, but then you know all these um, hoodoos are, are are there to be broken. I think that's one of the one of the great things about sport. I think um, we hadn't beaten Galway and Mayo in the championship in 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 the uh, in the same year up until 2019 and almost 20 years as well. And we've now probably been more successful in Castle Bar against Mayo than we have been at home. So all these things change. And, and uh, that being said, we're up against the Galway team that are huge, huge uh, favourites, uh, if you go by the by the bookies. And they're very seldom wrong. Uh, and, and correctly so. I mean, any team that's coming back off um, been league finalists, uh, the votes have been uh, some... We know uh, all Ireland finalists last year and probably should have won the game. Um, and we're, we're very close to winning it. Um, so Roscommon will, will uh, not withstand the fact that we had a great win against Mayo. Um, we'll go into the game as huge underdogs. Galway major, major, uh, major favourites, and a couple of question marks over some of our players as well in terms of injury. So um, th- those are things that are, are uh, all going to play out on the day. Um, I suppose you know. When you look at Galway, the, mo- the amount of quality they have, like even even off the bench, Killian McDade probably won't start. Um, it's it's probably unlikely that, that Damien Comer will start as well. So they are two players, household names that uh, Galway can call off off the bench. We certainly don't have that depth just yet, but are, are working towards it. And um, we'd be hoping for pl- kind of similar to me, oh, that we can can control the game, we can keep the game tight and competitive and uh, maybe then let loose in the last 10 minutes. But it's going to be a big ask and looking out at the weather here this morning, uh, it looks, I think the weekend has promised good. So maybe the environmental issues that we had against um, Mayo may not, may not be as persuasive to, to us kind of killing the game. But then, um, you know, you don't know all these championship matches take a life of their own at certain stages as well. If we can be as, as good in front of goal as we were the last day and just take our chances and, and have something to build on, well then uh, the game could go to the wire. Yeah, it's your proper proper words of purity there, killing the game and controlling the game. And I, I must ask you, Shane, how important is it that Roscommon start well because um, we saw against Mayo like if, if Galway happened to say get an early goal it would be three or four points up after ten minutes you know they, they've been warned about the way Roscommon play would you have any faith that Roscommon could come back into the game or do they need to kind of as you say control the narrative early on and get ahead I, I think when you're underdogs and you're at home especially I think um, controlling the game is, is, is imperative you know and uh, if, if you can get the we have, one thing we have is we have quality not to downplay our, our chances or anything like that, but we have quality forwards and we, we've had them for quite some time. I think you know, and in in um, the brothers Smith and, and Murt are, are well known, and Connor Cox indeed has, has come off the bench, and now Ben O'Carroll is, is adding to that as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, controlling the game for us, Carmel, is, is key. I think if you're in even in the modern game, if you're chasing it, you spend so much energy chasing it that um, it, it can have a debilitating effect on your tours in the matches. And generally the teams that are, are the stronger players are on the middle third. Um, when you're when you're trying to see out games, they will, will do that. And um, in our case, um, I think that for us to get the crowd up, have the crowd on our side, have a kind of a cauldron-like atmosphere in the height, uh, if we get off to the start with a goal, maybe, and, and uh, certainly control the ball around the middle of the field, which will be difficult with, with Galway's quality, um, then it gives you, it gives you a, a fighting chance. And you know, I think Davy Burke has alluded to it in many of his interviews that it's fierce important now that come and get out of kind of, we did in, in the league, the yo-yo element of up and down, but also now the championship, uh, embracing the, 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 the privilege of pressure um, which comes with these matches. And... Uh, being consistent at this level, you know, I think we can probably now look at the at the Gaelic football um, uh, season has been almost three competitions. So you have the league to start in the middle. Now we have the provincial championships, and then I suppose the real the real um, the real comp then starts with the All Ireland series. But a win for us common on on, uh, on Sunday can't be kind of downplayed either because the the the, the carrot is huge at the end of it. It means you you probably miss out on the top six of Division 1 teams um, if results go the way in, in, in the provinces which is expected mm-hmm. and one or two maybe of the, the other favourites like Dublin so um, it's a huge huge fillet Philip, um, for us to try and beat Galway you're almost in an All-Ireland quarter final uh, if you can do that and um, 
that's the sort of pressure that maybe in the past we we uh, we raised uh, we got to a kind of a glass ceiling with Connacht and we couldn't get any further in the Super Eights and a couple of bad beatings and, and things like that mm. and confidence ebbs away. So uh, there's a, there's a lot riding on, on Sunday's game and uh, for Scotland they'll have to can to seek and back to back performances in the championship like they did in 2019. Um, and and see then can they can they win a college championship? Michael, I'm, I'm I'm intrigued to hear the the cute comments coming out of us coming here already. Uh, huge <laughs> huge underdogs, major yeah. major favourites. Galway, are you are you going along similar lines to Shane? Absolutely not. And I, I'll I'll point out as well that I think Ross Common came from four points down in the league in mm. Pierce Stadium a couple of months ago to to win by a point. Uh, they finished with the last five scores, if I'm not mistaken. So. You know they, that can uh, that'll be drawn back in in dressing room chat, and they'll um, they'll be recalling that as well if they need to this week. I think you know Ross Common pose a, a huge threat. It's um, they're a very strong side. They're probably got the start they wanted in the league that allowed them to build towards championship in Connacht. Um, they got their wins early. They secured their um, Division One status early. And maybe that allowed them just to kind of stick to plan, plan A, which was, you know, do achieve that. Everything else may be a bonus, uh, but but look towards. They knew at that stage they were going to be playing Mayo, and and if they were to get over that, uh, followed by Galway, and before they could even get to a provincial final. So, I think they are where they want to be. I think they're a very dangerous position from a Galway perspective coming into Sunday. Uh, confidence would be very high. Uh, they're at home, and I know there is a an issue with their record there, but. Um, you know, it'll be packed to the rafters. There'll be a majority home crowd there, and you know, Galway will have to be on their game. What's the vibe in Galway, Michael, about the way that Porrick has trained them this year? Because it's it's such a, for the for the coaching sort of um, in terms of S and C and workload, it must be quite complex with the championship structure this season to know when to peak and so on. Yeah, and I'm guessing Galway have had as every county, but Galway would have been operating off a similar model whereby. <laughs> You know the league and the, the league final in the end. Uh, I can't imagine that um, took priority. You mm. know, once that was within striking distance, I still would feel that uh, in the past, you know, teams would have maybe said, "Okay, we're we're heading towards the league final now. We need to back off on the heavy training and we we'll keep the legs fresh because there's a chance of of glory here." <laughs> I, I'd imagine now um, the planning is 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 very definitively towards whatever the plan was set out in January or December. And to my mind, that is, you know, kickstarting for, from now and, and hopefully rolling through the through the summer. As Shane said, there's a phenomenal amount of games coming up in Connacht and beyond that. So uh, my guess is that, you know, that's that's where you're looking towards and, and trying to bring into a, uh, hitting the ground running or, you know, around now. Um, I, I felt in the league final, certainly we didn't hit the ground running early on. And that's probably cost the game or left us uh, along with, with a lot of work to make up. So that's a couple of weeks ago now. I know they were away for five or six days in Portugal, um, so you'd be hoping they're a bit more primed now to, to start strong on Sunday because they're they're going to need to. Uh, Kane Johnson does a bit of work with us on, on stats and analysis, and, and he's been pointing out as well, Shane, that um, Ross Commons' kickouts have been a massive uh, part of their game, and certainly you notice that against uh, Mayo and Castlebar, uh, they went along with thirteen of eighteen kickouts against Mayo and scored one four off them. Um, so, how do you expect Ross Common to to approach it this time? Will they will they go for the same approach? Is it weather dependent, or how do you think they'll they'll fare there? Well, I think very much so. There's a conundrum, I suppose, here with Galway that I think um, Galway probably have the strongest middle eight in the country, and certainly the the men mountains. I mean, if you look at the midfield, Paul Conroy and uh, and New Mahar or Kelly McDade, whoever starts, you have Peter Cook around there, you have Johnny Heaney. You've got you've got guys that can dominate the ball in the air. Um, Mayo's midfield isn't really you know of the quality that Galway have. They're, they're very strong runners, all right, but they're not fielders. And um, I suppose when when, Gal when Galway look at this match, they, they will be challenging the, in the Smith and Keith Doyle in the middle of the field for us. Going long, if we're not winning the ball, going short has has proved to be um, problematic. And um, when Mayo pressed us the last day. We looked like we could turn over the ball relatively, relatively easy, and uh, you know we don't really have the, the dynamic ball carriers. David Murray's brilliant um, supporting the ball going forward, but not necessarily bringing it out. And the same with Connor Daly and, and Connor Hussey. Um, they're very good to support the ball, but bringing it out can prove problematic at times. And 
I think Jamie Burke has, has said he's thought out, get the ball out into the mix around the middle third. Um, if you lose it, at least it's a long way to go. If you win it, you have the bonus of, of kicking it in or getting first phase possession into into really good forwards. Um, but against this Galway outfit, it's a different kind of story. And um, they're just really, really good around the middle third. And, and you know, you can't get away from that. When you, when you go to analyse Galway and you say, well, where are their weak spots? Um, there isn't that many of them, um, certainly in terms of physical physicality and winning that first phase possession. And, uh, you know, the, the league form, the league final, really, truly, you could argue they were by far the better team outside of the go- young Reap making numerous saves from AO. They could have won that league final by seven, eight, nine points. And Shane Walsh had an off day, maybe from freeze, you wouldn't expect that to happen again. Um, and he's one of the one of the players around the country that one of the top players in the country that you go to see and watch. And uh, that's a problem for us at the moment. Um, you know, you take the positives out of the Mio performance, surely without a doubt. Uh, but I think Go will be targeting if if Inda Smith is fit and, and able to play, uh, they will target Inda, I'm sure. Um, and if Roscommon can't come up with that ball in the middle third. Um, it will cause problems for us, and and that's that's just the reality of the game uh, and the way to play. And if we go short, Galway's ability to press, um, can we get out by it? So again, it's, it's probably similar for Galway as well. And um, going short is Roscommon have been quite good to be fair at pressing uh, in the league. They've done very well in carry at that, um, but it, it's taxing on the legs. And um, some of our lads, you know, the older lads, uh, the longer the game goes. It, the harder that gets gets if you're particularly if you're chasing the game if you have something to fight for um suddenly you find that energy but if you haven't uh, it can be problematic i it got i have to bring michael in there Galway could have won the league final by seven eight or nine points i definitely wasn't at the same league final but uh, <laughs> I, I think, uh, maybe maybe we had about 12 goal chances to miss the one thing michael though in the game in Pierce, the game pierce stadium you referenced um Obviously, Shane wasn't playing and uh, Damien Coleman went off after 10 minutes. Killy McDade's come back in now from the league as well. So you would think that yeah. Galway shouldn't really have the quality sort of that Russ Common forwards maybe don't have Sunday. Yeah, Killy McDade, I'm not sure. Um, there isn't a lot of talk, you know, one way or the other about him. And he's missed, missed a lot of time now. So I'm not sure how he's fixed. Um, he was a huge loss in the league final, wasn't he? He is. Yeah, he, he's, a, he's a huge loss. He's a massive player in that middle eight that Shane referenced. Just... Just the pace and power he can go at. He can add. He can. He adds scores. He he gives assists. But he's he's going to work back and protect the back as well. But um, you, you'd hope, yeah. Like I suppose Galway, what Galway need is a you know a return to form or, or fitness of of their key players from from last year's All Ireland run. Um, you know you mentioned them there. Shane and Damien up front. Um, Finner, Rob Finnerty up front as well. He's had a stop start mm. league with injury as well. Like. They were massive for us, as, as anyone will remember who watched the Galway games last year. They're the, they're the scorers. They're the lads who will knock defences. We're going to have a very, very cagey affair the next day. I, I would hope a goal happens early for someone. Uh, I think it would it would open the game up a little bit. If, if it doesn't happen early, we are going to have a very, very tight first half, I, I would feel. And and that whatever might happen in the second half, it could open up. But a goal like that could be decisive. So... Galway have those players. I, I have to say the likes of a Ben O'Carroll, you know, the Sunday dry sod is going to suit that guy a lot more. Um, he was very slippery when he came on in Pierce Stadium. I, I saw him I'd thread over a one, if not two, you know, sweet, sweet points. So um, there's a lot of kind of match up, matchups that are going to be picked out and, and studied this week by the management teams. Um, you know, Damien Comer and Shane Walsh, if they're on form um, or if they're on the pitch, I suppose. We, you know, there's going to be a little bit of... Um, a little bit of chess being played early on. So I, I as I said, I'd love a few early scores just for the for the punters watching on to to see the two teams maybe draw them out a little bit sooner than they might naturally. Um if it's if it's tight, it's probably going to be tight into the second half. What was the narrative at home, Michael, about the game Castle Bar? Because like it, it was bad in isolation, but to contrast it then with what we had between Monaghan and Tyrone, it was like this is Gaelic football at its absolute best in terms of drama and scores and uh, I mean, there were probably people in Roscommon who felt they didn't get the credit they deserved, but it wasn't exactly great football to watch, obviously. No, it, it wasn't, but uh, the conditions were horrific. You yeah. Know, from talking to a few people who, who were there, and, you know, you, you kind of have to factor that in, no matter no matter what you say. And, you know, there was chances like Mayo stinging the crossbar early on, you know, thing, things could have changed, but I think the resolve and... It was a lot made of a couple of the pictures of the Roscommon players, you know, the unity in, in their back line, um, you know, when they turned over Mayo ball and things like that. Um, 
there was a lot just it was it was a there was a no yielding feel to it as you watched it go on and, and yes they got to score crucial scores at the right time and that's what inevitably just gave them more confidence maybe sapped Mayo's energy a little bit or sapped Mayo's belief um, and it just fed into it but like they, they were very very good for it and and, and even though there was times when Conor Carroll at the back was being pressed and it was looking a little bit scary, um, you know, Mayo were, were putting them under that pressure. They still just rode it out and, and they finished and they kicked on and they finished with a couple of scores strong. Cox off the bench, you know, again, he, he's going to be a dangerous man if he's in the fray at whatever stage in the game the next day. So they were, you know, they were good for that. Um, I think they maybe they needed it a little bit more than Mayo. I don't know, but. Um, I think what we're what, it sets us up nicely for for a big game this weekend. Davy Burke has been very refreshing as well in 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 what he's brought to the to the league so far. And whether he has a surprise up his sleeve for what Galway want to do, uh, who knows? But um, you know we're in for a good game, and I, I hope with the weather, a couple of early scores, and um, just see you know let, let's let's give us something good to watch. Yeah, love love the comment in from John here. Shane Curran, well drilled by Davy Burke for this interview. Uh, <laughs> I have to say, and I, I'm, I'm going along similar lines to Michael. I hope it's not a 98 like the league. I hope it's good quality game of football. But regardless, yeah. lads, uh, very briefly, prediction time. Uh, Michael, we'll start with yourself. Who's going to win, and, and roughly by how much? If Galway are going to win, it's it's going to be we're going to see the the players that we expect to play play well, P- play first of all, and play well, and 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 lead them. Um, I remember Shane scored a spectacular goal here in the similar same fixture last year, and you know was was, was solid from play as well. So I think I, I'm, I'm assuming that Galway have have their main men on the ground and they're fit and fresh. I, I think we'll squeeze over the line by a couple of scores, uh, two points, you know. But if if there's no Damien Comer, if there's no uh, Killian McDade, um, if Shane Walsh isn't influential in the game, then it goes the other way. Shane, what about yourself? It's hard to argue with Michael's synopsis there, to be fair. You know, I think the two best players we've had, the two best players in the league for, for um, either team will, will fill both pivotal positions on, on Sunday. Uh, Sean Kelly for Galway and, and Brian Stack for Roscommon at fullback and centre-back, respectively. I think if we can get the matchups right, um, I'm not so sure if Conor Daly will pick up Shane Walsh or or, um, or or Brian Stack will pick him up. Um, and who picks up Donny Smith maybe will, will have an influence as well for Roscommon. Um, the heart says Roscommon, obviously, the, the head would say, look, at Galway are the better team. Galway are, are the team that have been in all Ireland's. Galway are the team that are have the design on all Ireland's. Galway are the team that are Paddy Power's huge favourites for, for the game. But as I said, these games take on a, a life of their own and should Roscommon give the supporters the, the opportunity to get behind the team in the hide, well then an arrow victory can ensue for Roscommon. But it will be dependent on all of the players um, striving for that, that level of consistency that's required. And, and uh, I think if we get that, um, we'll have a great game. And but look, I think the, the the conditions and the environment did play, play a huge part, as, as Michael alluded to there, and in the Mio game and the quality of it. Both teams here have got quality players, and uh, let's just hope that that the game, the day is a good day, and we see the best of them. And I think we will. And Roscommon to to um to to kind of just get over the line, maybe by a point or two, uh, should all be all be well. Yeah, you take that. Listen, lads, great stuff. Looking forward to the match. Enjoy it. I know the wiser as to who either of them fancies, actually. They went from, like, I'm saying such and such, but actually, what will they, they say in the dressing room if I say this? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. They, once, once a player, always a player. Like. Anyway. Great stuff, lads. Thanks for that this morning. Okay, boys. Good luck. Great stuff. Michael Meehan there, former Galway. Uh, what a great... He, he did use Jake the word. He said great Philip, and he said fillet by mistake. Oh, he was a fillet of a footballer, a fillet or whatever you want to call it. What a player, like. And, uh, footballer. Now, passing on the uh, knowledge to... Uh, the underage girls in, course, in Caltra. 100%. That game, 4 o'clock Sunday. And then, of course, we'll know who's, uh, who they'll face in the college final before that because Saturday, half past two, Markievicz Park is Sligo against New York in the other semi final. The first semi final, that is. Now, 8 28 a.m. on this Thursday morning, so to be, and we will be uh, hosting a live UEFA Champions League roadshow very soon in partnership with Just Eat. It's coming your way on the 3rd of May in the Mansion House in Dublin. We'll be joined by UEFA Champions League winners John O'Shea and Wes Brown, along with Arsenal legend Paul Merson. It is sure to be a brilliant night's entertainment. This is an exclusive off air event. Tickets are limited. So don't delay, go to offtheball.com forward slash events and we will see you on the night. Just Eat, the official food delivery partner of the UEFA Champions League. We'll have Vinnie Perth in studio up next to talk League of Ireland. But first, Kenny Cunningham joined Joe Malloy on last night's football show. Take a look. 
What a good defender uh, Wes Brown was, I've got to say. Probably doesn't get mentioned enough no. in dispatches. Like, he had a long career there, didn't he? No, he, he burst on the scene. Game, I was doing Michael Richards thing. He, but he burst on the scene the treble year. Yeah. In a big way, as backup to Gary Neville. He played a lot of games. Many games did he play, Joe, would you reckon? Uh, I don't know. He had a lot of bad injuries. He had a lot of bad injuries, you're right. But what a, what a, if he uh, hadn't had the injuries, I think we're talking about a very different career. Yeah, he was a great defender, though. Um, he's hard, you know what I mean? Fast as well. Yeah, yeah. No, he's brilliant. When he, I mean, that 99 season when he, kind of stop saying burst on the scene, but the predictions were big and I think he might have done his cruciate. Yeah, he did have a few battles. You're right, set him back. Well, hadn't, you know, he wasn't that kind of ball playing type, which a number of them have been over the years. You know, the like, obviously the likes of. Ferdinand and um, he played 232 times for Manchester United Tim. however he was there from 96 yeah. to 2011 he was there right I mean he hung around for all yeah, the that's injuries that's what I'm saying like yeah yeah I was a, he was a fine player fantastic um, centre yeah Kenny Cullion there joining Joe Malloy on last night's football show at uh, just approaching half past eight in this Thursday morning's OTBM delighted to have in studio with us Vinny Perth how are things Vinny? Good morning how are you? Oh, good uh, uh, sure. looking off the referee from the leg you to talk oh, we were talking the leg of Warsaw <laughs> game so Johnny was uh, yeah, he actually has seen bemoaning those. handball the handball rule earlier What's your, what are your views here? yeah I'm, like it's funny I'm still not over that, that decision and um, it's little things like that when you come out again because that was um, and who knows but we were 1-0 down I think at the time and then that that decision sort of shifted the whole tie to Leslie. Remember, that was a playoff for group stage Champions League football in the Viva Stadium. And then we went over there and we took the lead. Sensational Robbie Benson goal. And then they had a man sent off. But that goal was pivotal in the tie. And Andy Ball's hands were actually... You know, I'm on radio here, on but ground, it, like couldn't, it couldn't be any more behind his body. And um, But again, it's funny um, when you watch the game back and you listen to people in studio... It was a debatable decision. That's where some of this stuff is so... Grey area. Grey area. It wasn't debatable from from our perspective or a lot of Andy people. Andy Boyle. Andy Boyle. That's, deba- that's not debatable. But, but uh, there was people in the studio that night who said, oh, we can, it was a handball. So. What, if, you, if you want to fall backwards on the ground... What are you going to do? Put your hands up in the air? I mean, like people, you have to realise that your hands move in a football game. Yeah, and very seldom, as you know, do I agree with you. Well, I agree with you on this <laughs> stuff is... We have another 20 minutes here, like. When you Any time to disagree. Well, yeah. when you, the, the problem I have with VAR is, I think it's been a real help in, in different situations, but referees should not be allowed to see anything in slow motion. Mm. Right, because I, I I've no problem with the two handballs being given or not given last night. If if that happens on the pitch, but when you slow stuff, nothing happens in slow motion. What if a player deceives very quickly? Then the slow motion is necessary to determine if that's happened. Yeah, but but the whole point of it, the football game doesn't happen in slow motion. So in, in terms of offsides, it's very clear. Someone's either offside, and we don't like how close it's getting. But it's black and white. If if he had an armpit offside and he can score a goal with that armpit. He's offside, so that's black and white, no issue with that. Takes a little bit longer than we would like, but other stuff is just played in, in, in real time, and that's it. And you shouldn't be allowed to see stuff in slow motion. I'm just completely against that part of it, because the game's played at speed, and uh, trust the referees a little bit. Mm. The other conversation we had earlier was that the League of Ireland has become cool, I think, John, is the is that the phrase we're going with? I mean, it's hard to argue yes. that. It's pe- there are people now going to League of Ireland matches, as Johnny said, that you would never have seen going to the League of Ireland matches. Yeah, and I, th- I think it's a mixture of, of that. I think some clubs have done it really well. There's, there's a niche around balls. There's also a, a certain niche around St. Pat's in terms of people going. But somewhere like um, somewhere like out in Tallaght, the job the Shamrock Rovers have done, mm. that's, not, that's not necessarily about being killed. That's about something in the area for, for people who genuinely, like Tallaght should be a real hotbed of soccer never mind Shamrock Rovers element. We should be able to develop football after football out of that area. And even if you think about Richard Dunn, Killen Arden, um, Robbie Keane, Feather Kern, the, um, the, the Irish international manager is, to give you people listening from around the country, was born within a mile of Tallis Stadium. Stephen Bradley, the league champ, um, the, the current league, league winning manager, was born within a mile of that stadium. And the under-21 manager, Jim Crawford, was born within a mile of that stadium you had Richard Dunn there's so many good players so but it's about um, and if that I believe and the FEI have, have done a lot of work in that area but that should be 
places like that should be hotbeds for our soccer, and it's starting to happen. Not there yet, there yet, but when when you go to uh, what what I love about going to a Rovers game is. Um, the fact they get lots of stick helps me. I like that. But mm. when you're walking, you see people coming out of again. You get much people, stick at the Rovers games. Yeah, yeah, still a little bit. It's great though. It's good. It's good fun. <laughs> it, wa- it was too far the other way, but now it's just good fun. But you see people coming out of, and again, I understand people listening won't know these areas coming out of Kilnard and Jobstown, Springfield, mm. Time and North, and you see them walking the game, parents and kids. Like the and old for, days, yeah. for me, that's huge. Like I used to get a, on a bus down to Harold's Cross to watch Pat's for argument's sake. Or, or get a lift over to Richmond Park. And when I see people walking, and that's real, that's how England is so good at what they do because the stadiums are in towns a lot of the time. You, yeah. you go to Goodison, you're you're walking in, particularly if you stand on the Gladys Street and you you could have a cup of tea like within uh, 20 yards of, of pe- uh, putting your ticket through a turnstile of, in someone's house. So I think that's usually important. But it, it at the same time... Um, they're small enough numbers in terms of, like Drogheda is selling out now, but it's small enough in terms of capacity. So we have to sort of, we can't take these people are turning up for granted. And I go back to a couple of weeks ago, the heavens opened up in Dublin. People travel from Derry City. That's the so best awful. fans in the world. I'm telling yeah. you, they're, they're brilliant in terms of yeah. how they sing. Mm. Um, and if, if I'm going to a Derry game, I'll sit near them for the bit of crack and listen to mm. them. But they stood out in the rain for her. And I mean After rain. three and a half hours, stood out in the rain for another two hours and then sent back up to Derry. So we've got to look after these people and don't that, take them for granted. That's the thing, and the stats came out this week. So attendances for Premier Division games up by 27% in the opening nine games of the season. That will come as no surprise to anyone. More than 55,000 as well have attended uh, First Division games so far this year with the average attendance going up again. But that's the, the issue that this money needs to be invested in the in Yeah, the and, and go back to, say, Leinster Rugby, who are you know one of the top rugby teams in, in Europe... Um, their attendances weren't always as high as you know you can sell out the Aviva in the next couple of weeks but you could quite easily get a ticket for um, um, the, the st- what's the stadium you see Do you, uh, uh, RDS, uh, RDS. Yeah. Yeah. and then all of a sudden it takes off so momentum will come and I think League of Ireland is ready to take off to go to another level just make sure we have to have some of the facilities in place and when you watch um, Rovers and Shells you don't know for me I've watched a lot of shells this year and when I watched that game, you're looking at some people are going, Shelburne are a really good football team. Well, of course, they're technically very good, but they're playing on a really good stadium, a really good pitch and people go on about TV courage, coverage and all that stuff. Just get the basics right. Mm. Football pitches first and this country aren't good enough yet and then um, the rest and the stands and, and the whole lot and the whole lot will come together and we're slowly getting there that game as well Vinny like um, and the, the producer in the studio who's looking after the cameras he pans to the sideline and there you have like Joey O'Brien and Damien Duff yeah it's brilliant uh, these are in their infancy in terms of management <laughs> On this TV. is a big yeah. big deal for them this is everything to them at the moment these are Premier League players and they're managing shells who are essentially a mid-ranking League of Ireland team yeah, and we take I- that for granted almost mm-hmm. Yeah, we we do a little bit, and but at the same time, that just adds to the to the what's the word the the box officeness mm. of a Damien Duff. Like I mean, um, Rovers are, are, are um, Shelburne at the live game again this week. You know, are they following Damien? I don't know. It might but, be a little but bit. But look, yeah. um, but look, there's some there's some big names in the league as well outside of that. That's that's that all that just helps to it. It it, it brings it lets people know, but. But it shouldn't be any shock to people that someone like Damien and Joey are really invested in their football club because you don't get to the level they're at by doing football half hours. And anyone that knows Damien, I, I only know him through doing a course with him over a two-year period. He is the most touring man in the world. As I said on here before, I think he debates with himself if he's going for a bottle of milk, which brand to get, mm. and he'll, he'll make sure he gets the right one. Because... But you don't you get to the, that from him. But you don't you? become a, a premiership. You don't be get to the level he got to without being so invested in what you do. Just a question for you, Vinny. So, like Stephen Kenny would have spoken about, he was detached from the Jack Charlton kind of Ireland team because of the way we played, and that's kind of controversial in hindsight because like Jack Charlton did. Um, a lot of things that were quite evolution, revolutionary at the time in terms of pressing and stuff like that. But we didn't play a nice standard of football. And if you look back at say. I spoke to somebody last weekend who was at Ireland and the USSR in 74, which is Liam Brady's debut, 
And we passed the ball on a bad Daily Mount pitch like a really good team that day. Johnny yeah. Giles and Liam Brady. And I was watching that game during lockdown and it was one of these games that they played back. And I was like, how are we then pigeonholed as this country that couldn't play football, right? But if you go to the League of Ireland, where is this kind of um, hegemony come now where everyone is trying to pass the ball? Give or take. It's a real on-the-ground league. And if you go, I think, Vinny, to underage as well, oh, they're all coaching to pass the ball from the goalkeeper out at under-14 level. Um, at like Longford Town, all the way up to Shamrock Rovers yeah, I, where, where does that come from? I, I think two things I think the game has changed in terms of how it's played and how people watch the game and, and people understand the game a little bit different in terms of it used to be 4-4-2 um, I, I, I debate this many times with, with someone like Stephen I don't I don't subscribe to that argument that someone like Jack Charlton I think <clears throat> Jack Charlton pretended he, f- he forgot people's names and stuff like that. I think that su- suits the after dinner speaking as well a little bit. But <laughs> go, go back to, I'll just bring up one goal real quickly. Go back to Ireland against Italy in, I think it was in the Joint Stadium. John Sheridan came and got the ball off Dennis Irwin. Mm. Short. He, Jack changed uh, John Sheridan's position a little bit and he became a little bit deeper. Okay, he went long to an Andy Towns or to a... Um, Tommy uh, Coyne. Uh, yeah, but remember where Ray Houghton was playing? He was playing on the right wing. He was playing narrow. That's something a lot of players and Pep is doing now with, say, um, Grealish playing narrow or Foden. And Houghton is in that sort of number 10 position to pick up seconds. That didn't just happen by accident. That didn't just, like... Oh, uh, Ray Hampton ended up in that position. So, remember people, John Sheridan hitting the bar in the second half? Yeah, it's a lovely, lovely move. And, as well, and the, yeah. the way we played, uh, Andy Townsend actually switched position and, and sort mm. of because he went into the, he, he gave us a real running power from the 10. Just, just to make the point that football is is changing and it has different cycles and um, I think to, I think to go on about say someone like Jack Charlton I think is completely disrespectful because. Um, you know, he got to major tournaments and he did. But we were pigeonholed things. as a country that couldn't really play football. It was like this British style of football. No. Like when the dog went into Europe, there was there was genuine surprise when you played Maccabi Haifa that day. And I think you were quoted after the game where you may have spoken to Benny Una or whatever. He's like, I love the way you play. Like you play the game the right way. But this was an outlier. It was like, oh my God, you're an Irish team. Not only that, you're a League of Ireland team and you're passing the ball here. Mm. And it took us a long time to prove we could actually do this. Like. No, but Br- British football was played a certain way um, and continental football was played another way. Mm. I think they've all merged mm. into being very similar now, and there's different variants of it of all different shapes. But I, I, I just think it's. I think that was overplayed from both sides a little bit. I mm. think they were closer than what they should be. Italian football was very sterile and and whatever, and wasn't about conceding. Where British football was a bit more bl- blood and thunder. Mm. I think we've also got to be careful of where we are now in the league in terms of the there's some games at the moment that aren't good. And it's too much actually passing, and it's right. too slow, and it's 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 passing for the sake of passing, and teams need to be a bit more adventurous. And then there's a lot of goals being scored, and you could argue because defensively teams aren't good enough as well. So it's about finding that balance. And um, well, teams aren't being caught out at the moment because the league is so close. They're, they're, and the, the gap isn't big enough because we haven't got really outstanding teams potentially. So you've got to find a balance in all that, and I think. Uh, not go overboard one way or, or, or yeah. the other way I would feel uh, Vinny the AstroTurf argument has come up once again this week Colin Healy was, was quoted um, talking about the, the number of injuries and, and certainly last week on Sunday Andy Boyle in the warm up Greg Sloggett during the game at Oil Park suffering injuries Stephen O'Donnell linking the number of injuries both Dundalk and Derry City have suffered to those Astro surfaces so this this is a, an issue that's not going away yeah, the, again, I I like to think I'm in the I like to be on the fence or in the middle on this stuff. So I obviously worked in Oriel Park for nearly nine years. Um, so so a couple of things. I was really surprised by Stephen O'Donnell's comments. Right, not that I disagree with them, I just wouldn't have said them. Because as the Dundalk manager, as the Dundalk manager, because straight away, if if I'm um, a Shelbourne player today and want to take the next step, step, which is which is say Dundalk and proper full time maybe it's not but Shelburne's a bad example I, I ain't signing for Dundalk mm. I'm not signing for Dundalk because there's a higher risk of being injured if I can find a comparable club and I think that's part of Dundalk's problem now because you've got teams now like Pats full time Bowles full time 
And um, so a Bowles player is now has a better option. He's probably trained on grass and playing on grass. So that's a big call. I agree with you, but is he trying to force their hand and say we need to change the pitch here? Yeah, but is he playing a game? Well, unless head? unless the club has somewhere in the region, of, and ju- just to mm. be clear, somewhere in the region of seven hundred thousand pounds to change the pitch back to grass. People think you just rip up this and and plant mm. seed. There's there's a certain structure underneath the astro turf that has to be removed, and then when do you do it? Do a dog play in Drogheda for? Because you can't do it in the off season because yeah, it's winter here. Yeah, it takes too long. Yeah. So it's a it's a huge call, and um, but it, there is an issue there. Um, absolutely. The the uh, I seen one article uh, this week in the Sun, really good article, but it was sort of critical. Neil Arden piece, piece was sort of critical of previous owners, but actually people who put down this pitch were the ones before that who were back involved with the club. And he saved something like twenty five thousand pound at the time by not putting what's called a bounce mat in. Yeah. And it's really hard underneath. I think the elephant in the room is um AstroTurf pitches aren't bad. They're needed in this country to help developer footballers because of the climate, because of the restrictions on, on the amount of land we have for people to play football. But the two at League of Ireland level are two of the worst ones you'll find in the bloody country. So there's some really good AstroTurf pitches around the country. You go and play in European football, you'll probably play, if Rovers get to a group stage Europa League, I would say highly likely, statistically, play against someone on AstroTurf pitch. Mm. The Rovers players won't come home from that saying, pitch was terrible, it was dangerous, any of that stuff. The ones that are in our grounds uh, in Derry and, and Where Dundalk are, the good are really in poor. Ireland then, actually? Oh, uh, there's lots of them, um, like... In, in just local level mm. where people have put proper money into them. as I said does it uh, and I'm not an expert on Astro Tough pitches but mm. I know from like I, I, I brought people in at Dundalk to try and uh, again encourage our owners to, to remove our Astro Tough and um, by putting the proper structure in and, and, and the maintenance of them is huge like Mal Hyde United's pitch at the moment they've got two of them they're excellent mm. Cherry Orchard had put one in does does Examples so just were, regressed of any, do you know? Yeah, of course, you do. Yeah. It's a product that wears out over time, and um, but again, maintenance is huge on them. And like, the, but the injuries, Shane, is is really scary. Like, yeah, um, it's it's something that people have to get a grip of because it's it's. Well, we're making the point during the week, Vinny. Sorry, like, wh- where are injuries now in terms of bad tackles versus players just getting injured on Astro? Yeah, innocuous challenges. Yeah, like John Mountney had done his crew shit, ironically playing for Pats. In Oreo Park, he then done his other cruise shit, playing uh, playing for Dundalk. Um, young Young Kane um, from Shelbourne had a really bad knee injury there and still hasn't played. Uh, Sligo lost two players, Brannock and, and S- O'Sullivan, to to ankle injuries. And a player underage the following day. In yeah. The same, o- o- yeah, up in up in Brandywell, uh, yeah. the Brandywell. Um, I remember going to the Brandywell the, when we came out of Europe, so it was mi- mid enough season. I lost Patrick McElhenney, okay, to a tackle, but his foot got planted on the AstroTurf pitch. Uh, Dave McMillan went up for a header. Michael Duffy and Daniel Kelly lost four players that day, uh, and it was off the back of a big run, and three of them never played for me again. And we only lost at Europe by three points that year. So it can it can be really detrimental to the people if it's not well maintained and looked after. There's someone up the north yeah. where players will tell you they're excellent. I think they're four in the but do you know the mad thing is like Terryland Park, which is like as you would know, Vinny, yeah. an excellent surface for yeah. years and years and years. And talking to Noel Connolly, one of the best grounds when I'd say in the world, not to mind the country, how what he's kept, he said there were over forty games in one month in May. And even Noel Connolly, which was so sacris like sacrilegious, was saying we have to consider going down Astro if Terry Lamb went down Astro I don't think it'll ever happen thankfully after the debate we're having now but mm-hmm. it would be the saddest thing because that beautiful pitch in the West of Ireland just another Astro pitch which is going to regress and I hope whatever Vinny says about the, the cost I hope we don't have any more of them in the League of Ireland anyway whatever happens in Brandywell and Oriel yeah, certainly the, the injury statistics are, are a concern we should mention lads the fixtures um, tomorrow night four games in all Cork City take on Derry at Turner's Cross at Strada versus Bowes at Weavers Park Shelburne Playing Dundalk at Tolka and St. Pat's against Shamrock Rovers is probably the big game uh, at Richmond. And then, of course, Saturday uh, evening, we have Sligo Rovers against UCD. Anything particularly taking your eye? Every week, we have a good game. Yeah, like, I think, I think yeah. at the moment, um, at the moment you, you've got a, there's not a lot of focus, um, set, like for whatever reasons, not a lot of focus on Shamrock Rovers. Mm. They've played 10 games and won three. That's only a 30% win rate. 
<laughs> they won those three of their last four, like so. They were all of a sudden. It's it's mad. You can look at it two ways. It's Pats are second, and Pats are having a terrible season. It's mad. I, I, like. I, I wish you, I wish you had um, been thinking that way back in 2019. The point, <laughs> the point I make is, uh, yeah. To, to, no, to be clear, the point I make is, it's a big game for them. I think, I think they need to kick on and win. I still believe Rovers win the league by ten points plus. Really, Jack okay. Leaves. Uh, and even if Jack Bourne leaves, there's talk uh, of Jack Bourne going to MLS. Does it? Does it? Does a couple of bids in? Two bids, from, yeah. Charlotte is one of yeah, them. Yeah. Um, um, I don't know. Is Giannis answer? I know he's out contract at the end of the year. So all of this stuff nowadays. What, is there anyone playing games or whatever? We'll find out because their window shuts this weekend. I think so. We'll find out in the next three or four days. But he's been sensational. He's back to his very best. Uh, Rovers are far and away the best team in the league. Do you think um, that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't think. Even Derry at the rest. The problem is Derry have a couple of injuries, so we're not seeing the real Derry at the moment. But doesn't every team will get injuries? The difference is if Rovers get injuries, they'll still be exceptional. So, uh, but it's a big game for them. They need to. It's all right being playing. They're playing excellent. They're playing really well. But they need to kick on, and I, I think this is a big test for them, and a big test for Pats as well, who've been. Well, Shell showed how to marshal Gaffney and Burke. Do you know, close them down and just give them no space. The, the other work. thing for me was Jack Moylan had. Jack Moylan had the Rovers defence in ribbons at times. He really did. And that was the one thing I think that'll encourage Pats because at least Pats are going in. And I think they do seem to be a good counter-attacking team, Vinny, as well, which yeah. they might have to do even at home. I think there's a template for Pats out to beat Rovers. Yeah. I'm just saying, again, I, I'm I'm talking up Rovers. I'm just saying, this is a big test for them. Need to, like you, you cannot win a league by only winning three out of ten. Statistic having a thirty percent win rate. Yeah. So I'm saying this is a big test for them. But there's a big template now. Pats play similar way to how uh, shells play, and the, the front two of Pats I think will cause them problems um, in terms of Rovers on the counter. We're seeing about why the League of Ireland is cool or whatever. Adam Murphy, um, who I think started in in Daily Mount, he's a kid. I think he's 18. He's everyone's been raving about him at Pats. He's had desperate injury problems, and I I imagine he might start Friday, mm. which will be fascinating because I love seeing these young players coming through, and we've had. Uh, so many good young players in central positions being entrusted with the role at Bowes and Pats and places like that and I hope Adam gets because this will be massive playing against Shamrock Rovers or by his, by his street the best uh, midfield in the league at the moment 8.50am on O2PM John Duggan's also in the studio with us morning John morning everybody how are you all doing keeping well keep well the League of Ireland is cool that's the that's the main subject line this morning has the League of Ireland got cool I think Come it's cool. got a lot of interest from younger people and I think there's definitely huge growth potential in it uh, I think the facilities, obviously, we know are substandard, so I think they need to improve. And if he could get better facilities, he could get more people to games, um, he could get more of a buzz around it. I do think another thing that's important for the league is to know who the players are, because for many years, I think I don't think people, the general public, have um, had a connection with certain players or know who they are. They'd know maybe the top five to ten, but they wouldn't know beyond that. And I think that's probably the biggest thing for the league to try and pursue is that marketing knowledge of who these players are, the connection with their communities. Uh, so they're as known as Gaelic footballers and hurlers. That's the biggest challenge, I think, for the League of Ireland going forward. Um, there's the infrastructure side, but there's also the connection with the with the clubs. And there's a lot of transfer, um, you know, revolving door around players so um, I, I do think that's the biggest thing for yeah, these the points about young players or young fans that's mm. massive Vinny's on about these kids from Jovestown Killing you look at the when, when they pan behind the goal a Rovers game they're all young youngsters all young kids as Vinny says from the area around absolutely massive social media well these right, I think TikTok uh, yeah and they TikTok, all have, TikTok. I oh, think, I have over 50,000 TikTok followers yeah. I think it's uh, whether they're doing it or not I think it's really important for the FAI to get like the likes of Chidoziak Benny to go to Limerick and to go to Cork mm. uh, where he, he played mm. um I got that right, haven't I? Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so for Seamus Coleman to to like, the part of your deal as as an Irish player, part of your kind of and the, the lads would do it anyways to go to Sligo and, mm. and or to have like a, a couple of sessions a year or to meet the community or have Gavin Zoom is always a Rovers game. Have an open day or whatever, you know, and th that that kind of connection. Um, I think is really important for anybody who came from the league who's now playing across the water. Whereas Georgie Kelly scored this week for Rotherham, so Georgie Kelly was back to Bowes, mm. and and that is I think is really important. I think the identification you got to identify with with. Like we all talk in just in our sleep about it. like all the golfers, all the Premier League players, all the Gaelic footballers. Um, you know, if you were talking about Dublin Mayo, you'd probably be able to name most of the players on both teams. 
can your person on the street name the Shamrock Rovers and Derry teams 1-11 to 11? well that's yeah. the, the women's football team you couldn't name any players and all of a sudden they're on the side of buses and they're on billboards yeah, I, I think SEC like, or Tristy needs to do more but like the, the Irish team that played France for only five of them came from the League of Ireland yeah, that no, started mm. I, I think John point, John's point's well made the only thing I will say to you is locally a lot of that's going on so mm. if Pat Hoban went into and he does and have been with it you talk about David Clifford people say David Clifford walks in and there's a, there's a video of people just reacted to <laughs> David Clifford I, 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 I'd love to share with, uh, and we put it on social media, some, Pat Hoban walked onto a, uh, a training ground on um, one of these, you know, the uh, summer camps. Oh, yeah. And every player, mauled. I brought the player down, he was mauled. And pe- he was late coming into it, as in he was five minutes behind everyone else. And kids come from everywhere. So I think that's happening locally. I think it needs to happen nationally. Nationally to mm. then take yeah. it to the next level. Yeah. Like D- Dundalk or Bowes are going to the local schools and the kids are getting connection Rovers uh, do it I know up in Tala as well and the local school they even brought the league trophy to the school and my, my son was disgusted like sitting there going you know this is the, what's he bringing the trophy for <laughs> he, he in, stole yeah. it on me dad like you know <laughs> but it's but it is happening but nationally is the next step and I think I think the FEI have certainly got League of Ireland on their mindset to be fair to them a but, big sea change there, but like, it needs yeah. to go to another level and, and absolutely and you could make a good point as well could you name a Longford footballer or a Wexford Herder so, so maybe I'm talking about the top level of Gaelic footballers mm. so you could maybe make, make this argument that the League of Ireland club is comparable to a maybe lower ranked GA team in the championship mm. this mm. weekend how many Westmeath Hurlers can the casual person name but uh, most casual people could be able to name the top 20 hurlers, the top 20 footballers. Mm. And that's where the League of Ireland, okay, Jack Byrne aside, or the success stories. Like, would we have known to those Zig Benny before he went to the UK? Yeah. So that would be my, just my have observation a, on it. So multicultural as well. Like, yeah. you know, um, different colours of skin at every club at all levels. I love that. I love the fact that League of Ireland is a mirror to society now and football is still the working class game for me. And that's, I love that going to games where I can relate to the people. It's 15 quid in, whatever it is. It hasn't gone up in years. Years yeah. and you go to a game though. and like and I will say this time and time again per head of population some of our crowds the likes of Dundalk and Sligo for these small regional towns are up there with anywhere in the world really really good and we shouldn't be down ourselves as much as we are yeah 100% all heading in the right direction for sure uh, John this morning any other what else would you like to talk about <laughs> what, what's happening what's one of the main things this morning I guess uh, the Champions League has kind of been well, hidden the Champions bit. League like I think the thing with City is did they, would they do anything silly last night they didn't mm. that's the thing so once Haaland scored it was all over um, as as intense as it was for maybe about an hour against Bayern Munich I think the issue with City in the last years of the Champions League has been doing stupid things and conceding goals in quick succession uh, that didn't happen last night Real Madrid the interesting thing about it is their second leg is at home uh, on Wednesday the 16th of May the first leg in the Bernabeu on the 9th of May against Real Madrid Inter AC will be a fascinating semi-final obviously uh, Milan hey, Derby Ashton City John is yeah. this the best City squad they've ever had? Um, I think it's comparable to the last few years uh, Vinny but I, I, what all these things is um, do they have any injuries at the moment they don't but I think the key thing is Haaland and maybe Shane Keegan was in here the other day um, you know, talking about, well, they haven't scored more goals, they haven't done this. But if you look at Haaland, is scored 48 goals this season. And I just think that um, he's a special sauce. And also... So, uh, so the reason I ask you is, to, on Haaland's a good point, just you take the all the centre-halves they have at the moment and he's managed them brilliantly. I don't think he had that strength before, but Haaland is the best example of it. He only has one way of playing now because he has to play Haaland, so he has to play a nine. So you, you think now he's not going to mess around with this. You know, we know he has messed around and done different things. So whether it's Grealish or Mares or whatever, I just think the Haaland thing is huge because it's forcing his hand on months yeah. ago. I need to play with a nine. I can't play with a false nine. Because yeah. he, he's turned up in Champions League games, finals, and done crazy things. Well, maybe Haaland has given him that little bit of uh, security. And Pep keeps on making the argument to press conference as well, you know, other clubs have had to get used to the Champions League. And uh, like, I remember it did take United, say, in the 90s, quite a few years to get mm. their head around the Champions League. He's making that point about Napoli this season. And maybe he does have a point around that. It's also a way of hiding, as you say, the madness of not playing Rodri, a holding midfielder in the game against Chelsea in the Champions League final. So maybe having Haaland there as a focal point. Um, Will they bottle it, though? 
will, if, if, will they bottle it again? And will I don't it, think so. I don't, don't think so. This is because this is the year they just so. have to get it done. Uh, yes. Is is that capacity? If Sane had gotten the first goal last night, is there potential for City no, I, to think? I, I, oh, I, here I, we go again. I don't feel it this season. I think. City maybe might be peaking a bit later than they would yeah. have had in previous seasons. So mm. once again, they're behind Arsenal in the league. I think they might have been peaking a lot earlier in campaigns before this season. And with all these things, is the maturity of. But if you know you got somebody that is a, a machine and in, in, in up front, it means that like remember like the last few years. I asked Nathan, for example, who's the best player in the Premier League? You see in the flesh, and he go Phil Foden. Yeah. Phil Foden hasn't been talked about in the last yeah. few months. Yeah. I know, I know he's in an appendix out and that kind of thing, but that just shows how big it is. Um, and there is a depth there. Uh, like Calvin Phillips hasn't even landed a Manchester mm. City. So mm. I, do, I do think Stones has had a really good season, a really revitalised season. I, I just delighted for John Stones. I, I, I remember having an argument with someone about four years ago. He could be one of the great centre-halves of all time of English football. And when you think of it, he's actually lost in the middle of that City team because if you think of it, if you were English, English centre-halves, Look at his trophy hall. Look what he mm. will end up with, and he plays in a lot of the top games. I just think he is. He's, he's they have options. And, they have and options. They've options, and I, I just hope. And and to to hold, call Johnny up once more. Sorry, Johnny. Is can't bo- go back is, to twenty nineteen again. No, but on. is losing to Real Madrid really bottling it? Like you're talking about the highest level of football. Yeah. Right? I think they threw it away last year. Yeah, maybe yeah, not yeah. bottling okay. it. Yeah. So yeah. got to go here. They, 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 could, they could they could lose in a way. Here all day. They could sorry. lose a very tight <laughs> semi final. Yeah, um, yeah. which wouldn't be battling it but I, do, I think like, a bit like Leinster in the rugby they have to win it yeah okay because with Guardiola he's had too many great analogy Leinster <laughs> like, they Monaco, probably will. Monaco they probably Spurs will. Leon these were all uh, matches they, they should not and have and I hope it happens yeah. seems to be final <laughs> classics regardless but uh, lads 859 John thanks a million right, as lads. always Vinny thanks, thanks for coming in as per usual uh, up next we will have the Kenny legend in Taggy Fogarty previewing the weekend's hurling plenty of action there as well uh, first though more from last night's football show I'd know, it's, it's Man City to win the treble. Man City to win the treble? Yeah. Oof. Yeah. I would say that in every competition they're in, I'd make them he- certainly strong favourites to win the Premier League. Strong favourites? Yeah. No, I, I still think Reeling that's tight. No, I still think there's a lot tighter than you're talking about. No, I don't think you can choose between the two of them at the moment. They'll win the league by three points or more. Agree or disagree? I thought you were going to say about eight points or no, more. No, well, let's be fair. You've reined that right in. <laughs> Four I points. I think they'll win the league by at least a point, maybe <laughs> two. <laughs> oh, easy. Four points. I go to four. There's only eight games left, and they're how many behind? I take for the champ. I take in Champions League. I fancy for the Champions League. Yeah, kind of. I'll say. I think they're a good, they're in a good place. Pep doesn't look like he's going to throw in a wobbler. Yeah. So <laughs> FA Cup, yes. That's only a matter of concentration. Oh no, no, absolutely not. Who? We've just been talking about Brighton at the weekend in terms of the, the performance they pitched up at Chelsea. Mick's telling me I have to go. Ugh. <laughs> I'm staying. You're going. Okay. <laughs> 9am on this Thursday morning to O2 to am that was Kenny Cunningham a conversation with Joe Malloy on last night's football show time to turn our attention to the weekend's action in the hurling and plenty of it too we have Aidan Taggy Fogarty on the line with us this morning morning Taggy how are things? Shane how are you how are things? Keeping well thanks for joining us just to run people through the, the fixtures we have to look forward to this weekend in the small ball Saturday we have the Leinster Senior Hurling Championship round 1 uh, Antrim Dublin and Corrigan Park at 2 o'clock you have Galway Wexford at Pierce Stadium at half past four and then at six it's Kilkenny Westmeath at Nolan Park from six uh, plenty of action the Joe McDonough as well Kildare Kerry uh, Carlo Leach and Offaly Down there's Christy Ring Nicky Rackard and Laurie Maher plenty of action also on Saturday and then on Sunday uh, also Laurie Maher Christy Ring action but uh, the attention mainly will be on the Munster Senior Hurling Championship round one it's Waterford versus Limerick at the FPD Semba Stadium from two o'clock and after that four o'clock Clare versus Tip at Cusick Park in Ennis so loads to look forward to uh, this weekend Tigerty I just wanted to get your thoughts first Tigerty uh, a little bit of concerning news coming out of your own county this morning the back of the Irish Independent uh, Michael Verney has a piece on Billy Drennan uh, and a potential uh, injury blow for Billy Drennan it seems like a leg injury uh, that fears growing that this injury could end his summer which would be a, a massive blow for Derek Ling and, and Kilkenny two goals and 70 points Drennan scored in the league he scored 212 20, for the under 20s against Galway just last weekend um, this will be a massive blow Taggarty if uh, Taggy if if he's out for the season Yeah Shane um, I just heard this morning has got a text myself there saying that um, he, he could be out I don't know the ins and outs of it at the stage you really know more than I do there on, on the back piece of the independent there um, huge blow for Kilkenny if it is um, now in saying that um, Billy has been excellent during the league um, phenomenal he was on the freeze and he was our he was our find of the league really uh, if you look at it. 
Um, Jerry was obviously looking for players. Uh, he captained uh, the um, under 20s last year. Like, super hurler. Um, and it's an awful shame if, if he is out. Now, when it comes to championship, he saw him in the in the league final. Uh, I thought myself, the big question mark about Billy Drennan was, he's brilliant on the freeze, but what does he contribute from play? Uh, in my opinion, he was excellent up to the league final. And, and that's fair enough. You're playing an excellent Limerick team. Uh, and he wasn't really shown from play. So the, the big question mark was, you know, what was he going to contribute without taking the freeze? And then, of course, with TJ Reid coming back in, question was, will TJ be on the freeze? Will he not? So if he's out, obviously TJ will be on the freeze. I think myself, TJ will be on the freeze myself anyway. Um, but it'd be a massive blow because Billy Dren has been superb and he has been superb during the league. And the likes of that, Shane, the likes of a fellow coming on, like you're not going to be expecting Billy Dren to be come up and score one eight, one nine in championship, four or five points in play. Realistically, what you want from a player like that, what Derek will be looking for is, you know, a player just to gel in and make a little bit of a difference. And when the ball is going into his kind of area, just to make it stick a little bit, you know, just on one or two points, not to be, you know, dictating the game at all whatsoever, but to play along the side that the likes of Mullen, TJ Reid, you know, uh, Mossy Keown and these lads, and just to fit in nicely and, and makes some sort of a, just a different type of a player, something different for the other teams to play for. And that's the aspect really that will be missing if Billy Drennan is injured. Uh, one of the big games I suppose to focus on, Taggarty, Taggy, is... Um what for Limerick and and I mean where Limerick are at where you know where they're at and, and every team is kind of bigging them up and they're all in this together I think was the quote David Burke is using on the back page of some of the, the papers this morning um, is there a blueprint whatsoever in how to beat Limerick like what do Waterford do this weekend well that's the conundrum Shane uh, we don't know you hit the nail on the head we know exactly what Limerick are going to do Limerick you know they've been talked about they've been analysed they've been dissected they have a super panel they're a better team this year than they were the last couple of years, you know, the strength and depth, huge. So the question is on that game is what is Watford, what are Watford going to come with? They didn't take the league serious. Um, they were playing a very defensive looking system. They played one up front. Uh, Kylie was up front there. I was at the Kilkenny game to the, to the terrible game, Kilkenny Watford. And Watford didn't look like they wanted to win it. Kilkenny just kind of went on and won it for the sake of it kind of thing. And that's the way it looked like. Uh, so the, the big question is, what is Watford going to come with? They went off to Portugal for a training camp. I was just reading the Independence more and Jamie Barron about how it's changed over the over the course of the six months between Liam Callan and Seth that it's gone very tactical, very analysing um, certain things, uh, you know, how, how we're going to play. So realistically, it's how Watford are going to set up and how Limerick are going to deal with that because Lim- Watford are, at the minute, are, are the unknown. Davy Fitz have been playing them down uh, you know, saying we have a lot of work to do. In my opinion, that's a bit of tactics in, in, in my own sense because Watford aren't a bad team. They're not like this time last year. We were saying Watford were the ones to put it up to to Limerick. They have phenomenal players. They went two twenty one, I think, to thirty points in the first round of the championship last year mm. to Limerick. They were only three points off them, so they're not too far off the mark. And the problem is with Limerick is what to expect, like. What um, Davy Fitz is going to want to do, he's going to want to upset Limerick, take him, drag him out of position, you know, pull him all over the pitch and, and, and put on their running game. Now, the problem with that is Limerick are so used to it. And the thing that Limerick is, and I don't know people, people have kind of mentioned it a small bit, is they get to grips with the team at half time. We've seen in COVID with the water breaks, how exceptional after the water breaks Limerick were, because they're, and they're anal- whatever they're doing in their analysis team, I see laptops out in the league final. You know, Paul Connerk obviously has been spoke about. They seem to do to, to relative the problem and uh, d- d- um, put their finger on it and rectify it in the second half. So the thing for me is, I can't see this Waterford Limerick game being a spectacle as in a super game, but I can see it being a grafting kind of game. And then the second half, Limerick kind of get the terms of what way Waterford are going to play and come out and, and kind of get over the line. But like, the, the, they're serious players like Caelan Lines, Hutchison, Jack Fagan. Prunty on Galan, you know, Prunty always takes on Galan, Tyg the Burke on Keane Lynch. Like, just really, really good matchups here. So, I think it, it, it'll be a, a tactical kind of a battle, if you get me. It, like, I think, Taggy, just watching watching Limerick close up, it's like probably the best standard of hurling in terms of you've ever seen, really, in terms of their physicality, their athleticism, and so on and so forth. Is there any concern within hurling when you look at the football championship this year that you've so many teams, like, realistically, that could, could win the All Ireland? I think you could nearly sit, stretch to six or seven teams in with some sort of a shout that um, hurling's in a situation now where uh, Limerick could literally obliterate teams 
teams left, right and centre and just make this a very uninteresting championship. Is there any fear in hurling about that? Yeah, yeah, of course there is. Um, Limerick have blown away everybody nearly this year so far in, um, in, in the league. Now, albeit, the league is totally different in hurling now. Um, no, as far as I can see, uh, teams put very little interest in it to, to try out players, to, to, try, to try different things. But definitely Limerick are on a cusp of a wave at the minute. They Just everything is clicking for them. I think it's the first time ever they, they have no injuries whatsoever. There's 37 players on the panel. Um, they're all going to train. They're all fighting for places. It's becoming to a stage where they're just being competitive inside the camp. And that's a great place to be. You know, you talk about motivation. Motivation about getting on the team. Because people say all oh, places are rough for grabs. But that Limerick team is pretty much the same Limerick team that has been gone for the last three, four, five years. But the thing is, if anyone drops their standards, that's when people get in. And so Limerick do not want to stop their standards. And there is a fear factor out there that, yes, this championship will be just mundane and Limerick will just blow them all away. But that's the joys of sport because you just don't know. Last year, we were kind of saying the same thing. Um, but in the Munster final, you know, uh, Clare uh, put, put into a, a draw after full-time 70 minutes. No, just a cracking spectacle. Uh, Galway in the semi-final came really, really close to him. Kenny weren't too far off him either. So there is that kind of sense of Limerick will just walk to the championship. But then again, I kind of look at it and say, championship is championship. There's always upsets. And the thing with Limerick is, if you beat them once, you mightn't catch them again. So I'm hoping they come through Munster <laughs> unbeaten and then they might get caught in the semi-final and be knocked out so they can't regroup. That's what I'm hoping. And just David Burke as well quoted, obviously, in the papers today, saying he felt that uh, Galway really had Limerick actually kind of... Fit. Their body language, they were a little bit rattling in the second half last year. And then David Burke was on to say, um, I think Henry has a better panel this year, almost talking Galway up. Where are Galway at? I think Galway are, are, are very, very close. Um, I, I was thinking about that myself, and I was looking at it, and I said... Maybe back in my time when teams were playing us, uh, there, was a, there was, was one team that always thought they could take us down, and that was Tipperary. First of all, they, they had the tradition, and I suppose maybe, for want of a better word, they're nearly cocky enough to believe that they could take us down, and they have, and they did. Yeah. Do you know? Uh, and that, that real kind of sense of belief. So what other teams is, do they really believe they can beat the Slimmer team? Do Cork really believe it? I'm not too sure. Waterford, Wexford, you know, Dublin, you know, I'm not too sure, but I think Galway, behind it all, believe they can do it because they have the physicality, they have the players, they are their second year in with Henry Shefflin. Um they, they, a lot of them players, the likes of uh Dahi Burke, um, you know, <coughs> Grow McInerney, these lads are coming toward the end, you know, the latter end of the stages of the careers. So if they're going to do it, perhaps this is the year to do it. And the thing with Galway is they they flatter and deceive sometimes. As we said, we're having this conversation again. I had it last year, the year before, Galway are the team that could do it. And I think with Galway they nearly need to throw off the shackles. And they need to get a little bit ruthless. And when they have teams, you know, pinned down, they need to really put the, the pressure on and put them away in games. You know, just get that really ruthless edge. And I think get a team spirit going. You know, there's a, there's a team spirit in teams when they win our Ireland's and when they get over the line, you know, in real crunch matches. And that team spirit is kind of like can't be broken. That, that kind of a real spirit. Brian Cody was talked about beforehand about, you know, that, that unbreakable kind of a team spirit. And I think Shefflin needs to work on that a small bit. Uh, with the club scene up there, the, the, it's toxic at times. And I wonder about Galway, like, really as a four, as a whole team, do they really buy into each other on the field? Uh, you know, maybe when the championship is over, do they go off, you know, go for a few pints themselves? Do they ring each other? Do, are, they, are they buddies off the field? You know, mm. if they bring that together, get a real kind of a drive, Galway could be the team. And also Clare, I, I have a sneak feeling for Clare as well. Like Clare in the league, they've never took the league uh, um, uh, seriously, in, in my opinion. But, you know, championship, Clare do well in championships. Clare have won the last eight championship games uh, from 12. And they topped the table last year. Like, Brian Lohan is uh, not bad, you know, in, in a serious, serious competition. Like, Munster is a serious competition. Uh, but they just need that little extra belief when they get to the all Ireland series of getting over the line. They seem to have Munster nearly kind of cracked. Uh, but they're there together a while as well. And Brian Lawn, I, I rate Brian Lawn um, highly. I think, you know, he's he's down to earth. He gets a drive out of him. And, you know, you have players coming back into that Clare team as well. Uh, they, they found uh, they found a couple of players uh, this year, I, I feel. Um, you know, Aidan McCarthy is after coming back as well. Uh, he's a massive addition. Mark Rogers, Adam Hogan, 
Um, you know, these kind of guys. And then you could have a forward line of Tony Kenny, uh, Shane O'Donnell, Aidan McCarthy, <laughs> David Reed, Ian Galvin, Aaron Shanahan, you know, Peter Dogan. They're not too far Decent. off as well if they yeah. just get it right. 100%. That's, uh, yeah, that's one of the games I'm, I'm most looking forward to this weekend. Claire Tip, Cusick Park and Ennis at 4 o'clock. And of course, it's a neutral venue for Waterford Limerick because Walsh Park unavailable for them. So Seba Stadium it is. Taggy, enjoy the action this weekend. Thanks as always for hopping on. Thanks guys, thanks for having me. Great stuff. Taggy Fogarty there, Kilkenny Legend. Um, Henry Shefton will play that clip back to Taggy. Go, we happen to win the All-Ireland. Now we'll have a few points, you know. <laughs> Tell me about Team Spurt. Yeah, I think he, he's alluding to something that definitely was the case. I'm not sure it's the case anymore. Um, the worry for Galway is... Are Limerick actually have Limerick gotten better? And <laughs> I think I think Harlan is at I a, thought it was impossible, but maybe they yeah, have. I think it's it, it is a concern for Harlan this year. First of all, the, 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 the scoring level is a bit too high for a lot of people in mm. neutrals, I think. That might sound daft, but like you don't want a basketball game either. No. There are too many scores in games to to a large extent. Um and I, I, I do think the clash between Harlan and football in terms of viewing figures and interest this year is going to be very interesting because football is going to be compelling from start to finish. Yeah, for sure. Especially once you reach those the group stages mm. and stuff. Uh definitely it's gonna be interesting. And as you said, that the, the Litter being a bit light as well mm. as maybe added to a lot of those those uh, they're athleticism. They can just well, hit, yeah. they can hit they can hit points from practically everywhere now. And you don't really want games where it's regularly one team scoring over thirty points against no. good opposition. You don't want that in my view anyway. Hundred percent. Uh nine fourteen approaching on this Thursday morning's OTB AM. Here are some highlights coming up on the OTB Sports Podcast Network today. We've got Wednesday night rugby, the football daily, and John's virtual insanity golf tips as well for you. You can follow OTB across social and subscribe to the OTB Podcast Network. After these ads, it's Declan Lynch's version of You Had to Be There. You're listening to OTB AM. The Football Pod are hitting the road again. And we're delighted to announce that we're heading to Killarney for our first big show of the summer. All with thanks to AIB. It was quality. It was a good one. (laughs) Join us for a brilliant night of football, chat and crack with plenty of focus on the All-Ireland Champions Kerry and the contenders who are coming for their throw. Does it keep you up at night with not winning Sam McGuire? No. This is an exclusive off-air event and tickets are limited, so don't delay. We have a great show ahead. We are going to get our special guest out tonight. Tickets are €20, Euro, including booking fee. Go to offtheball.com forward slash event now. The Football Pod, in partnership with AIB. Check out hashtag the toughest for more. Fighting Words, Ukrainian Action in Ireland and the Irish Red Cross have come together to host an exciting concert by some of the best-loved artists from both Ireland and Ukraine at Vicker Street on Monday, 24th of April. Come show your support with more than 20 great Irish and Ukrainian artists, including Glenn Hansard and Callum McInumra, Cathy Davey, Roddy Doyle and Paul Muldoon, all taking part in support of the millions who have been forced to flee Ukraine. A concert for Ukraine at Vicker Street, Monday, 24th of April. Tickets on sale from Ticketmaster at just €25 or go to Vickerstreet.com. OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. It's so unexpected. It's one of those you had to be there moments. You had to be there. It subsequently genuinely did change everything about my life. I had to be there. Yeah, latest version and latest episode of You Had To Be There on this morning's OTBM. Delighted to welcome to the show this morning the Sunday Independent sports writer Declan Lynch. Declan, how are things? Good, good. Thanks for thanks for hopping on. I know this is a this is a stressful slot for a lot of people because narrowing it down to five is not not an easy thing to do. Your list, no. I have to say, is eclectic and different and varied, um, and it's a throwback as well. Some of them we'll uh, we'll get straight into them because at number one. We're going all the way back to 1974. It's an FAI Cup semi-final, Athlone Town, your own uh, beloved Athlone Town. Um, in a 5-0 defeat, I think it is, to Finn Harps at Oriel Park. Um, memorable for a number of reasons, this one, Declan. Yeah, um, this was um, such a big event at the time for, for me and for any Athlone Town fan. Um, we were in the Cup semi-final for the first time. We'd, uh, we'd gone up with Finn Harps a few years before into the League of Ireland. So there was kind of a, the two clubs were kind of on a similar sort of footing, except Harps were really good now. They were, they were very good. Brendan Bradley and Charlie Ferry and players like that. Uh, Athlone were also very good. Uh, this was the team that the following year would, uh, the famous draw with AC Milan, you know, so they were, they were, they were a good side. And, um, it, it was it was such a, a a kind of an event because it was in Oriel Park and uh, I guess the you know there were such it was such a prize at the end of it. I mean the idea at the time that you would have 
the, be in the FAI Cup final and it would be covered live on television <laughs> was kind of incredible, <laughs> right? Uh, at the time, it used to be a big thrill if you got a little, uh, you know, highlight, a few minutes of highlights on a Sunday night on this RTE sports programme that they used to have. Uh, uh, I remember like if, if there was TV coverage down in St. Mel's Park, you know, they'd throw up a bit of scaffolding and... Uh, <laughs> you know, build a, a kind of a temporary TV stand and poor Jimmy McGee would have to climb up the ladder and um, and, and do his best for about like three minutes of, uh, of highlights. But to actually sort of be in, on the cusp of, you know, having a full, uh, you know, live uh, cup final uh, at, at Daily Man, it was like, you know, moving from medieval times into, into the modern world. So all of these things were... Um, kind of creating this huge sense of occasion on the day. And Athlone, I think, you know, they'd stayed in the Valley Muscandal and Hotel in Dundalk the previous night. You know, it was a big deal. Everything was being done properly. And uh, we were very confident, even though, you know, Harps, Harps were very good. And everything, everything went horribly wrong. Um, Harps were great on the day. Uh, they went into a 2 0 lead. And at that point, uh, Something, something snapped. Literally, I mean, Mick O'Brien, the goalkeeper, who uh, was a beloved character. I mean, Mick, his heart was absolutely in the right place. Uh, he was, you know, hugely fit and enthusiastic. And you know, at St. Mel's, he used to do all this these complex um, exercises to keep himself entertained while the ball was at the other end of the pitch. So he was a real character, you know. And uh, uh, everybody, everybody loved Mick. And Mick was maybe so upset or so kind of disturbed by what was happening himself that he, he swung on the crossbar uh, at Oriel. And the crossbars at Oriel were not made of the same stuff as the crossbars at St. Mel's, which were kind of steel, I guess. Or We've something. got a video here rolling across the screen as well of, of one of these incidents, I think. So he properly breaks in half. Yeah, he just, it, it was literally just, it was a wooden crossbar, I guess. And he wasn't accustomed to it and it just broke uh, and it was just so shot. Uh, there was a, an announcement you know is there a carpenter in the ground <laughs> no this kind of thing he was playing left fast. back <laughs> uh, and uh, they they kind of the game was stopped for several minutes and there was you know they literally hammered a job together on the crossbar uh, and and the game resumed somehow uh, it did, went into a further decline for Athlone it the match finished 5-0 for, for Harps, but at a certain stage, Mick, he said later that he was trying to fix the bar, that he saw something uh, that he thought might might sort of fix it. I guess he might have been afraid it would come down again or something. And he, he had another kind of go at it. And again, the whole thing came. So twice came it down. happens. <laughs> okay. Now, this was, he was sent off, uh, he was actually suspended for, for a good while afterwards. Um, it, it, it appeared on Saint and Greavesy the following weekend. Oh, brilliant. You know, kind of, all right, Saint, look at these, look at the Irish, you know, <laughs> like our disgrace spread throughout the world, you know. Uh, it was like the worst possible outcome for, for the day. Uh, like, I remember going back from Dundalk that day, and, and I don't, you know, I don't think I've ever been as. <laughs> I was depressed after any sporting event. They would, either, you know, since I mean, I'm permanently scarred by this, you know. Uh, and that was the famous, uh, but and it was such a pity that as well it was Nick O'Brien because, like, you know, uh, he would he didn't let us down on the day. Like, you know, Nick would never. Nick was was a, a great guy, you know, and um, he he, you know, it was really unfortunate that it was him, of all people, who. Uh, who became the sort of a uh, poster boy for the stay of shame? But this, that, that was that. this should be a precursor to like you know permanently scarred from us. For, uh, you just named like three sporting events. <laughs> this is our slot for. A yeah, yeah. I could definitely you had to name. be there. You were definitely scarred from us. Maybe come up with a different name for the, <laughs> for the slot. Um, that's a brilliant first pick, Declan. I have to say, your your second pick is is also nostalgic. It's mid seventies, late town. Um, now the late town races are such an important part of the the East Meath culture. Um, but and, and often used as prep for the Galway Festival, I know as well. But it, it's it's a tradition that goes back so so far, Declan. You remember, in particular, um, even one of the horses you backed back in the mid seventies as a kid. You know, you see, it was the first again. I was just a kid. It was the first race meeting I was ever at, uh, and my father brought me along to it. And 
it's it's a mind boggling thing that Maytown is still there, and and it was there at the time. It's it's like a pop up race meeting, you know, <laughs> that was invent that was has been going for for you know God knows how long, what a century, more than that, uh, and it's a full race meeting, right? It's like you know they have, uh, you know, it, to me at the time it seemed always a day out at the seaside or whatever, right? But it was this full race meeting, and it was such a shock to the system, like you know you have. Um, you know, you, you, had, you know, a, a set, a, a little kind of parade ring. They had a tote building set up, temporary tote building. Like it, it had all these sort of usual things of, of a race meeting, um, and including the actual uh, racing on the on the strand when the when the tide is out. Uh, and it was like this wasn't my first race meeting. It was such a uh, a formative experience because you know it was probably the first time I had a bet. You know, it's like probably twenty p or something of the total. And so I remember this horse Bay Tree that won, uh, and the idea would actually, you know, it was free money to be had. <laughs> the backing horse is extraordinary sort of a discovery. Um, it, 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 even like reading the papers beforehand, looking at the tipsters in the uh, in the morning papers. Remember the Irish press had a particularly good kind of layout. There was this guy who used to do uh, the form, I think it was called, and had, he used to give one, two, three, you know, he'd, he'd give a, uh, a preview of the race and go, you know, the, you know first, second and third. And it, it struck me as well that, you know, what a, a, an image of life in general, you know, when you, you read the uh, tipsters in the morning and it's all optimism and they're making a case for their their selections and it's all kind of you know the, the day is full of possibilities yeah and uh there's nothing quite like reading those guys on the way home right when, when with the old battered know, newspaper <laughs> right you now know what, what the day has brought and and reality has set in again right and uh, but I still used to enjoy reading them somehow on on the way home, just thinking like you know, God, you know uh, how 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 you know that that glad confident morning. No more uh, as 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 we as we uh, you know uh, drive drive home with, uh, with with no money. Totally relate uh, to what he's saying it, as well. It and was it was fantastic just to uh, just to be at that meeting and. Like I've seen it covered by at the races and stuff, who regard it as a great novelty. This you know race meeting on on, on the strand, uh, but it it set me off reading. My father used to bring me to race meetings, but there was a, a good friend of mine whose father as well was a big racing man, and he probably I probably went with more to more meetings with him because he was an absolutely inveterate. He, he was from the north. He was a solicitor from the north, from from Armagh, and a lot of those guys used to go to. There was a bunch of them used to go to a lot of meetings like Dundalk and particularly the Phoenix Park, uh, which would be my next selection, I guess, uh, for in terms of racing. Uh, I loved the park particularly. I, I think it was, it's one of the great losses to our civilization that there's no more racing, no more race at the Phoenix Park. Uh, it, it there was just something about it. It was um, like it, it was a very very odd track, you know. Uh, it had very strange finishing. Post like the post, finishing post was at a, at a weird angle of the stand. It wasn't like head on. It kind of was, uh, you know, at, at, at a funny, a strange angle. Uh, I, I'm not sure why. Like the stand were literally kind of you know, the wrong in the wrong place, kind of. But it just gave this kind of unique atmosphere to it. They used to have uh, this very old fashioned thing where you'd have the, um, you know, uh, the, the Artem Boys band or something would play a little, a few toots on the. Uh, on, on the of our, at the start of every race, like you'd see in American films at the start of the race, you know, uh, and it was just a really nice uh, place. Also, I, I also often thought that when the Kelsey Tiger came in, imagine if the Phoenix Park had been still there, that you could literally just walk up to it from the city centre. It was a real kind of uh, loss, uh, even though by the time it was finished, it was mostly it was always flat racing, and it had just like you would have like four and five horses in each race. Now, I, I still really, really loved it. And at that point, again, the, I was telling him this, this friend of mine, his father was, was a really big racing guy, and he would have us listening in to people's conversations. Like, we were just kids, you know? <laughs> so he would send us after Barney Curley or someone like that, you know? And uh, just to sort of get the vibe from Barney and see if he was listening, this basically snooping on, 
<laughs> just to see if he was, you know, muttering anything to one of his associates yeah. about what horse might be, might be, uh, you know, going to win this race. Uh, I remember once we were sent after um, Mrs. Magnier, who was the Clem, Clem Magnier, the trainer, his wife was seen going into the tub. Just have a small bed, I don't know, 50 p or something like that. And we were sent, there's Mrs. Magnier, go after Mrs. Magnier and see what she's, uh, see what she's backing. And, and we, we literally st stood behind Mrs. Magnier and heard her uh, backing her own horse. Right. <laughs> okay. 50p on her own horse. And we went back and th that horse won. So we felt we had, uh, you know, we had done great. We, we, we had sort of, we almost became men in that moment. You know what I mean? That yeah. we, uh, we had delivered the vital piece of information. I can relate. It was such relate. a great sort of, uh, you know, discovery, all that, the racing. It was like the all the intrigue and all the sort of, um, just part of the racing itself, which, which, which was great. I mean, the um, just the bookies at the time, like these Sean Graham, Terry Rogers, these guys who would take really large amounts of money. You know, I mean, they were on the nod that they would be taking like you know four or five grand, something like that, and they wouldn't wipe the boards mm. if they got that. You know, what I mean, they would they would take take and sort of in um, with the baby, they were seven to four, might become six to four. You know, uh, so it was great looking at that and just watching. Uh, Bookies themselves. I mean, I, I uh, sort of would look at these guys and think, what a job. You know, they all seem to have a bit of a tan, you know, <laughs> and uh, they had these big satchels full of money. Uh, and they went to race meetings all the time. You know, what, um, what a life, you know. Yeah. So, so uh, that, that, that'd be the, like the Phoenix Fire Woods would always be my, 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 my favorite track. I never really liked Leopardstown for some reason. Mm. Um, it was more suburban or something. I love the Curra. Uh, the Dock was a great track. Um, you know, but um, but the Finch Park, really, that was, that was the one. Yeah, that, bringing up a lot of memories there and like what, what Declan is saying about the paper and they used to have these mystical names. They still do like Captain Keen and the Tipster and this image then as the race meeting was just bleeding itself uh, to the, its conclusion to see the, the Irish Independent that one page that was like literally torn out of the paper just like flickering in the wind <laughs> and you look at those selections the crumpled kind of tattered paper that is now no more but had so much optimism yeah. more and great memories as well yeah lovely image yeah. <clears throat> for sure and your next pick Declan we're going to 1989 for your penultimate pick uh, the Republic of Ireland beating Spain by a goal to nil at Lansdowne Road this was a qualifier of course for the uh, Italian 90 World Cup um Great atmosphere this match, I'm told, uh, and, and, and a serious memory for you as well. Yeah, I mean, it was an amazing atmosphere. Um, uh, and it was almost like the last time you could, ha you could have such an atmosphere. I, I went with uh, with George Byrne, the great uh, rock um, journalist uh, friend of mine. And uh, George and I had, had been also at at the start of that era, or sorry, the end of the last match that Owen Hams, the manager for, was Ireland and Denmark. And uh, we were, it was a terrible day. Ireland were beaten 4 1 by Denmark, who were a really good team at the time. And uh, I remember that later that night, we were in the international bar, uh, drowning our sorrows. And uh, Eamon Mack Walsh came in, you know, the famous Medjugorje and Garden in Dublin, Dublin in the Rare Old Times. That of Shane, isn't it? And yeah, we were there, and Eamon Mack Walsh came in, and, and he completely said, uh, Ah, uh, Roy and Brew was the only fella that could beat them Danes, uh, which didn't improve our our mood any <laughs> any uh, greater. But uh, fast forward, and now it's it's it, Euro eighty eight has happened, and Ireland are now looking really good. But there was always this kind of this we just beating one of these teams like Spain, like in in a really important match was always kind of a bit elusive. I mean, that was a, would be a huge breakthrough if we could manage it in qualifiers for Italian 90. And uh, we were on the terraces uh, opposite the main, the main stand. And the interesting thing is, it was, it was just a few weeks after Hillsborough. So the whole world would, a football, like, a, a, you know, the standing on terraces and all that kind of thing would, would start becoming a kind of, um, almost a thing of the past. But there was this really intense atmosphere, almost like almost like a kind of a crazed atmosphere on the day. There's fifty thousand people at it, which in itself is kind of scary. And the Spaniards, they, it was really interesting to see it. Like they were disturbed by it, they were put off by it. Anytime any of them would go near the 
the touchline that they could throw in. They were they were shouting at them. <laughs> it was a really kind of frenzied atmosphere. And uh, I remember like Steve Staunton was out on our side of the pitch, like obviously for the, the first half. And he was really good on the day. He was, you know, he he, he was just just come into the side. And, you know, we would think, oh, here's another kind, Steve Staunton. You know, I mean, he's, he's, he's good. And he even was, wasn't one of the main players for us, you know. So uh, Ireland scored after about 17 minutes. And... Uh, at the time, we thought it was Frank Stapleton. It turned out it was actually an own goal by by Mitchell, the Spanish guy. Now I call him Mitchell because apparently that's the correct pronunciation. Everybody called him Michelle, but Jack Charlton called him Mitchell, and Jack was right. <laughs> now Jack wasn't intentionally right, but he just preferred to call him Mitchell. And as it happens, as luck would have it, Jack, Jack was always sort of lucky, uh, even in this for not pronouncing Spaniards' names. So it turned out as an OG, but uh, they, they, the Spaniards didn't take it well at all. I mean, like Utragueno was their big player at the time. He was taken off in the second half and they complained afterwards, you know, saying this was not a football match. You know, the pitch was terrible <laughs> and the pitch was terrible. It was a rugby pitch. Jack used to actually praise the groundsman for <laughs> making it as much like a rugby pitch as possible. Because again, he still portrayed us as this kind of bad uh, you know, um, the underdog up against these uh, sophisticates. Um, but it, it, it was, um, you, you know, the, the, their whole attitude was uh, this had just been, they had just been subjected to this sort of medieval savagery and and it wasn't football, which only kind of increased uh, our sense of jubilation. But it was 1-0. Ireland won that game. And that was absolutely, that really was a breakthrough. It was the final breakthrough, if you like, of Jack's team. And uh, they qualified fairly easily after that. You know, it was a great day when they beat Hungary 2-0, uh, I think, a uh, really sunny Sunday. Uh, but there was a sense that they were on the, you know what I mean, they, that, that they, were, they, they were kind of on the home straight at this stage. But that was, uh, you know, that was big. Yeah, unbelievable. Even reading here, Steve Staunton was not due to start, but Chris Morris, the regular right back, recovering from an appendix surgery, and then Chris Hewton moved from right to left back to, to accommodate. Staunton, your final pick then, Declan, is another brilliant one. Patrick Harrington winning the Irish PGA Championship uh, in 2007, a week before his first major at Carnoustie uh, in the Open. So this was at the European Club at the, the beautiful British Bay, down in County Wicklow. Yeah, it was, it was odd. They'd almost uh, put it on specially for Porrick because it was a week before he before Carnoustie, before he, he won his first major. Mm. And um, like it, it was like, a, it was a wee bit like Leighton. Uh, you know, you could want, people, we wandered up there with, with, like, with the kids, myself and a couple of friends of mine, uh, like who were like five or six years of age. Uh, and it was like very open and very, like it wasn't a huge crowd at it. There was a lot of local people and you could just kind of wander around after boring. You know, it was it was really unusual. It's like there's something very old fashioned about it. Uh, because you know, it, again, it wasn't like a, it wasn't the Irish Open; it was the Irish PGA, uh, which is like so. It wasn't a huge corporate event, but it was at the European Club, which is which is a great track, really. Because what I like about it is it's very understated. You know, the actual like the, during the, the Celtic Tiger years, you know, you know, all these Taj Mahals were built in the middle of nowhere in these golf clubhouses. You know, uh, the, the luxurious, um, ma magnificent sort of. Uh, 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 creations. Whereas the, the European club isn't really like that. Do you know what I mean? It's it's more sort of understated. It's all about the golf, you know. So it was, it was a great venue. They set it up more or less specifically for Porrick. But even then, like, you know, he now he won. He, he, one thing you get the sense of is how good Porrick Harrington is at golf. There's a kind of a myth that, that like, Porrick, he has many virtues and, uh, you know, he's wonderful attitude but maybe he's not all that good at golf you know <laughs> but he's actually really good right? and particularly his short game you could you know when you were up close you can see just how good he is around the green on links courses and everything which of course he demonstrated the following week but even the following week i remember on the saturday before they played in carnoustie a friend of mine saying look he said look look i love porridge but he's just not going to win major <laughs> so even then he's he's you know, he'd uh, set the thing up. He, he, you know, approached it really well, and he knew he was probably going to win a major. But even they, until he did it, nobody really believed him. But it was really enjoyable. Then naturally, he won the the Irish PGA. He almost felt he had to ensure it since they set it up for him. Uh, he, I think he won it in a playoff, 
Uh, but the day we saw him, it was really, it was really kind of pleasant day. You were up very close to him. Uh, you can see how kind of fit he was. Do you know what I mean? He looked, he looked really impressive. Um, and he was, he was just really good. So, um, you know, I always think like, you know, we he, he were there just before he, uh, he walked into the door, walked through the door into immortality. Uh, we, we got to see Corey, you know. Brilliant. Now oh, they're they're wonderful picks, Declan. Uh, just to run people through them again: FAI Cup semi final 1974, Mick O'Brien breaking the uh, the crossbar twice, the Athlone Town goalkeeper in that five 0 defeat to Finn Harps. You had the late turn races in the mid seventies in East Meath. You had the Phoenix Park races in the late eighties as well, uh, and the famous uh, late great Terry Rogers, the bookmaker as well. Uh, Ireland's win over Spain at Lansdowne in uh, nineteen eighty nine. That one 0 uh, win and Steve Staunton's performance that day in particular, and Patrick Harrington winning the Irish PGA Championship at European Club in 2007, a week before Carnoustie. Declan, great picks. Thanks a million for those. Uh, I know it's not easy to, to narrow them down, but uh, fair play. OK, thanks. Bye. Great stuff. Declan Lynch there, the Sunday Independent Sports Writer. That is your latest episode of You Had To Be There. It's so unexpected. It's one of those you had to be there moments. You had to be there. It subsequently genuinely did change everything about my life. You had to be there. Oh, of course, it's great sport. picks, great he, picks. He's actually not a sports writer, um, but right. maybe he should be. Um, I've been reading Declan for a long time, and and he occasionally talks about stuff like this. But like these are, th- that's the beauty of you had to be there. I f- kind of feel like I was, and I can relate to a lot of his talking about, particularly yeah. the old crappy St. Mel's and League of Ireland Laytown races, um, the old Lansdowne Road, like the mm. atmosphere. And you got to remember, Ireland at that time was coming out of. Um, the 80s and coming into like a slight newfound confidence going into 90 in terms of the country opening up and all that and the noise in the place I think we got it back for the France game I actually think we yeah. did for the first, first time, time in a while time. like yeah. the Germany game possibly which yeah. long scored was the last maybe it wasn't at that game no but the atmosphere in the France game it was you know this the image of like the player coming over to take a throw and almost being afraid that yeah. he's going to get like just basically barrel out of it like yeah. and, and a terrible terrible pitch as well making a fortress <laughs> yeah. you know we're talking about Astro now but lands down in those days I suppose it worked in Ireland's favour that day back in 1989 against Spain for sure uh, OTBM with Gillette Labs get the ultimate shave or your money back in the on night edition available now Johnny brilliant stuff thanks Shane thanks a million as always tomorrow's show Johnny will be back this time alongside Adrian Barry they'll have Ronan O'Gara Anna Capeless Nada Manua plenty more I'll be off to the, the World Snooker Championship this weekend so oh enjoy a bit of content yeah yeah you'll meet show. a couple of a uh, couple of um I suppose friends of mine um, yeah going over to see the snooker yeah, you'll, you'll definitely bump into them 100% yeah, you yeah, must, must get the contact yeah. details and meet good up experience yeah. Ronnie, Ronnie O'Sullivan and uh, Hossein Vafai with a little, little bit of war, war. I think Mark Ronnie's Allen is this the one for Mark Allen this Mark, year? Mark looks in good form but um, look if Ronnie builds up ahead of steam it's hard to see him beaten Neil Robertson looks strong already mm. I'm sitting on the fence Basically, is yeah. what, what I'm saying. like the, the lads in the game earlier. Exactly. Yeah. Looking forward to it, though. But uh, right now, we have Wednesday Night Rugby with Keith Wood, who was in studio alongside Rory O'Connor and Joe Malloy last night. Have a terrific Thursday. Welcome along. Wednesday Night Rugby coming at you. Rory O'Connor of the Irish Independent here in studio. Hello, Rory. Evening. And would you look what the cat dragged in? How are you? In bloody studio. There you go. I haven't seen you for ages, Joe. Well, was I just saying to you outside was we were having a quick... Coffee, I would think it's pre COVID. Yeah, it could have been. Could have been. It's good to be back. Mm. Up in the big smoke. You look the same. When you look like you're 50, when you're. <laughs> I've looked like that for 30 years, you know, it, it doesn't really change that it's, much. That's starting to pay off now, isn't it? Well, I don't know if it's paying off. It just is what it is. I've, uh, I've grown into my age. Yeah. Look has been consistent. Yeah. Uh, so, plenty going on. We had the URC weekend just gone, which was very good from an Irish point of view, four wins, and we have upcoming fixtures, Ulster, Edinburgh, Friday, 7.35, uh, Leinster away to the Bulls on Saturday at 3, Munster back to the scene of the crime, uh, Sharks, Saturday, 5.15, and then Connacht go to Glasgow, and they will know by the time they go to Glasgow what they need there to secure Champions Cup Rugby, 7.35 on Saturday. So we'll get into all of that. But I want to start with what you said to me outside, aside from the fact that I'm fraying around the edges since you last uh, saw me. Uh, Sam Prendergast so I thought you were going to play this right down you know I've been there I've seen it all before I've seen the new kids on the block let's it just wait and see it is my form um, and I don't like overhyping it and I know Leo came out during the week and said look the, the, the media like to um, uh, pretty much like to um, overhype everybody I've, I've watched him a bit this year I don't know where my hype um, radar goes with it I, he's a joy to watch um, and not because of his skills and you know, playing under 20 is different you can try different things it isn't as disciplined um, it isn't as 
uh, organised as as other rugby. Um, but I watched him play down in Cork for a couple of the matches. I couldn't get over his composure. Um, he's a bit of a wonky run, which is interesting. Um, and then you see him outpace a French winger to to collect a ball, go down, get up, take the tackle. He's a is he six three or six four? He's a big he's a big kid. Um, and then you say, well, okay, let him let him play, let him kind of figure out where he's going to be, how it's going to manage. And then Leinster do as they've done fairly consistently, which is throw guys in at the deep end at times and the, on the right chance and the right opportunity um, with nothing at stake but pride for the most part. Um, playing at altitude, everybody kind of sucking diesel a little and he's Mr. Composure for the end of the game to bring a team from behind to win down there with, you know, as you can't win anything with kids. You know, it was... I actually thought it was fantastic and I don't know if you can hold back the hype but it's again skills are fine and you, there's huge amounts of kids with talent in the country and you can see them when you watch any of the underage games but it was he had all the time in the world to do whatever he wanted it didn't seem to matter what was happening whether he was flat to the line whether he was catching a ball in the middle of people deciding to kick it out over his shoulder he was totally unflappable so I was I was excited watching that um, I'd like to see you know he has to be big enough and strong enough to deal with playing at, at a higher level and there's a um, development uh, phase that he has to go through that but he's just so calm I mean it's it's rare there's um, there's only one other guy that is showing that calm at the moment you know oh he's not he's well no he, in, in terms of calm is that, but I, I, but the, sorry, that's still a big statement. Yeah, and so, so I, I look, I like the fact that you have a young fella um, who comes on, and there is a standard that's been set. So we've been complaining, not complaining, but we, you know, we're saying Johnny's playing and Johnny's playing and Johnny's. Fat. You know, I thought he should, probably should have retired a couple of years ago. Um, I'm happy to eat humble pie on that. Um, nobody has taken the jersey off him. Nobody has looked like taking the jersey off him, and. But I think you're now seeing younger guys coming through saying there's a standard that has to be got there. Mm. That's the standard they have to go for. So I I just enjoyed watching him play. I don't know whether you would accelerate him into an Ireland squad or not. I kind of think at times you'd want to. I mean, I, I'm the one... That, the World Cup. I'm, the, I'm the one who's permanently trying to say, look, you have to look after these guys. You have to try and make certain that they're, 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 they're good enough. Um, but... Um, it's it's a it's gone strange like it's in in the last three or four weeks it's gone unusual so we look at Munster down at at, at the uh, at the weekend um, Crowley played pretty well um, Ben Healy came on and actually took control of the game I think you've Joey who who would have been there thereabouts has has gone down a little bit and we hope he gets his confidence back again. Um, there's been a couple of injuries. Ross Byrne has come back in. He has done pretty well. But it's not cut and dried as to who, who it was. It might have been three months ago, and it isn't now. Mm. So I, I don't know. I, I haven't seen enough. But I've seen enough to be excited by the talent that's there. That composure, is a that's a hard thing to actually get. Mm. So you've seen enough that you wouldn't rule out bringing this guy to the World Cup? I don't, no, I don't, know. I, don't, I don't know that. And I need, like, he needs to play... Like he needs to play plenty of rugby, mm. and if you get him to play rugby, you know I don't know whether that fits in yet. And um, there, there's a huge risk in terms of elements of that. But, but I, I just it's a, it was a joy watching him, yeah. and I watch. Do you know what? Do you know what was really exciting for me I was down in down in um, um, Mosgrave Park and. Watching it, there was a load of kids, um, you know, I don't know what age they were, sort of teenagers. They were all excited by him. There was a kind of star pulling yeah. power. That's that's a pretty cool thing to have. And uh, look, I don't know. And I, I actually get Leo's idea. Look, let's not overhype this. Um, but um, I still look at French teams tend to put those guys in at nineteen and twenty. Yeah. you know. And so Mac was in at nineteen the night of the drop. Yeah. So you break it down, right? So Saxon's obviously there, and I think Byrne is definitively second choice. And Byrne is going to basically start your whatever's left in Leinster's season. He is going to get 
three or four big games in the Aviva Stadium to prove his case. And I think he's done enough now to say he's probably going. Beneath that, there's very little between the, the chasing pack. Frawley and Harry Byrne have remained with Leinster and will play, were on the bench for the last couple of games. And Harry Byrne, while the game was over against Leicester, did have some lovely touches. He's almost a forgotten man and you kind of feel like he's lost his kind of momentum that he was he was getting picked ahead of Ross at one stage in the cycle. So they're there and have a chance to impress. And it's very hard to see how Prendergast gets into the Champions Cup team. But could they get him into the URC knockout team? They've done it with Ross over the years. They do say that his frame needs a bit of they need to put some size on him and that he's that and that the S and C team are trying to put, almost hold the performance team back or the the rugby team back in terms of we need to put more size on this kid and the rugby guys are like, well, look what he's able to do. So then you've obviously got the... Jack Crowdy's got two caps and was in every training session for the Six Nations, but he can't be that far ahead of Prendergast. He's starting games for Munster now. He's seen off Carberry to, to a degree. So he's ahead of Prendergast, but how far ahead of Prendergast is he? Carthy is playing for Connacht. If they get a run in the... In, in the he's got a long way to come back from, but he's playing rugby. So I don't think he's that far behind, but I wonder... With, Farrell's obviously going to be the Ireland coach for the next cycle and, and does he say well let's get, let him go to the World Cup in, at the Under 20s World Cup in South Africa and lead that team and win an Under 20s World Cup potentially or because he's probably the best Under 20 certainly in Europe I haven't seen enough in New Zealand South Africa Australia but or does Farrell go no that's a, that's a development tournament I want this guy training with me on June 16th as our fifth out half I want to see what he can do in that environment and with that bank of training and three warm up games can I get him to the level where He's, he's there. I think it's an outside bet, but Farrell, who made his professional debut at what, 16? You know, his son played at 17 for Saracens, and, and you know, he was playing for England at a very, very young age. He's not afraid of giving youth his head. He has promoted young players in the past. It seems very late in the cycle, but this kid has something. And I think Andy Farrell's a very good judge of a player, and I, I think he'll be excited by what he's seeing. It's just whether he can just bring himself to leapfrog yeah. those guys but he's been ruthless as well with his selections well I was laughing because I was slagging you off last week for losing the run of yourself for two weeks ago with Ryan Baird I'm lo- losing the run of myself <laughs> this week and I, I accept that sort of stuff I think it's a lovely conversation to kind of to have um, because it's a change from what we would do traditionally mm. and um, uh, you know and maybe there are certain things that need to change for us to try and move on to that next level when it comes to, to World Cups and I I'm kind of comfortable having that as a sort of spitball conversation yeah. because it's an interesting way t- to go about it. But I just, he, but he is calm. You know, there's something... Uh, and th- there's a seven-day turnaround, at least, between every game at the World Cup. So how much action is your third-choice 10 actually going to get? So how much risk is there in bringing someone, even Crowley, who's only got two caps and will win a cap probably during the summer, but he's still very unproven at that level. Prendergast is two, three years believe that. He's got less physical development. He hasn't led through a Champions Cup campaign in the way that Crowley has. Although he wasn't even starting at 10 for... Like, the guys ahead of him are not that much further ahead of him. I'm discounting Carberry because he just... I don't see how you get into the World Cup squad from where he is now. But he obviously has 37 caps and is 27 and could do that job if he was... And that's, a, that's a topic we may return to. But from Prendergast's point of view... I suppose he needs to play well enough this week against the Bulls for Leo Cullen to, when when he gets back in Dublin next week to go, how can I lead this guy out? Maybe not against Toulouse, but the following yeah. week they've got a URC semi-final, uh, sorry, quarter-final against possibly one of the South African teams, possibly Connacht, depending on how far. He's going to have to make changes for that if there's a final to come. Does Prendergast get a little bit of a run in those knockout games? If he does well in those, does he come into the conversation? There is a route there, but I think it's I think it's going to be hard for him. And so, and so do I. I actually, but I look at it in this and say I want to see him play again. Yeah, that's the that's the that, that's the part because I think he offers something that's that's unbelievably exciting. Yeah. So whether that is in time for for this, which I think is incredibly unlikely, yeah, um, or not, but it's it's kind of watch the space really. He's, I thought you were going to throw cold water on this whole thing. I, you know what? I just, I like the game. And I like the game with people who, 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 who light it up a little. I can't think, think of you being as excited by a young player that we've talked about in the last decade. Um, uh, I, it, a, lot de- a lot depends. A lot of the guys that we've been really excited about tend to have been forwards that are coming through with, mm. a, with a huge amount of talent that's sitting ahead of them. Yeah. And we say, yeah, he's great. He's going to be fantastic. He's going to push him. He's going to push him. And there's a huge amount of miles that are left in the other people. Um, 
we are we have been searching uh, and we are consistently searching and we're still searching for a backup to Johnny and when you're doing that with a guy who's 37 years of age that's a kind of it becomes more uh, front of mind conversation than what's going to happen in two or three years time Harry the World Bur- Cup is Harry now you know it's like you know I, I, the UA for four years well, I think the World Cup thing is crazy because Say for a second, Johnny gets injured group stages and Ross Byrne goes down in the first five minutes of a World Cup quarter or semi final. That's a lot to ask Sam Prendergast to come on. It is. Of course it is. But it's a lot to ask Jack Rowley to come on. Of course it is. Mm. And Joey Harvey's got more experience, but he's lost form and lost momentum. And And if you go back back a few World Cups ago, um, New Zealand ended up with a guy who'd pretty much retired from rugby playing to put over the last kick to win. So. Look, anything can happen. That's and that's the point for for the conversation. What I would say is that was our first chance to see him yes. playing in a URC a URC game, um, to play as uh, composed as he did, as well as he did. I just want to see more. No, that's so fair. I think that's fair. I think that's pretty pretty good. So I'm excited by that. I'm yeah. allowed to be. I think you are allowed to be. And do you think? I mean, the way you're both talking, this guy's going to be the Irish number ten for the guts of a decade. I actually think we have options. They are just all on different trajectories, which we didn't for a while. So I think there is a good few guys that are there now. I'm still disappointed. I, look, I, I've said this before, and it would be it down to his own um, decision to go, but he wasn't feeling. But when I see Ben Healy coming on the other day and taking control, I'm, I'm a bit disappointed because for me, it looks like Munster are a little bit vulnerable at 10 now again. So because he's going to go and who's next up up on that and uh, I, I again I, I want to see Joey get his his mojo back um, and and try and you know lead lead from the front again because that's what's required we need as many it's looking for two and three players yeah. in each province that are able to control games so like I would say have you know have Prendergast as soon as we can get him the more he plays the more we'll see whether that's going to be is he going to be there for that I'm not making that comment but I'm saying he's exciting here and now so post World Cup you've got Ross Byrne Joey Carberry 27-28 and you've got Jack Carty who's 31 and Billy Burns I suppose who hasn't been capped for a while and I think I've, I would write off but I suppose he's there starting games for a province and then you've got this coterie of young talent I know Frawley's not he's 24 now Kieran Frawley I think he's really good 10 I think they really like him he would have been capped he was ahead of Crowley until he got that injury in the A game you've Crowley you've Prendergast you've Harry Byrne all within between 20 and 24 that's a lot of talent Yeah. now a lot of them are playing for Leinster and can they try and manoeuvre one of them up to Belfast to challenge like they got Jake Flannery up in, in Ulster who they like but they still pick Billy Burns when it's crunch time um, there is more we're in a much better place. If Johnny had retired in 2019 after the Japan World Cup, we would Ireland would have been in a much weaker position. Now, Carberry looked like he was ready then and he got loads of injuries, but it was two years with no Joey Carberry. I think we're, Ireland are in a much stronger position now in terms of 10s. And while I think Prendergast can be that player, he'll have some competition. I think Crowley's a really good player. I think it's very soon for him still because he because they didn't pick him a 10 for so long they almost gave Joey so many chances before settling on him it's very late in the season for him to be leading the team um, but it looks like they're going to go with him now and, and come this time next year I think he'll be you know, he'll have a lot more Champions Cup experience he'll have a Six Nations with Johnny gone Like the, the whole picture is going to change next year when he's yeah. gone because he's such a commanding figure he's the captain um, like who Leinster go with next season is going to be interesting if Ross Burns away at the World Cup does it open up the picture during the URC for someone to go and take that jersey it's a, it's, it's a very healthy highly competitive without that dominant alpha that Johnny is now Prendergast looks like he might have a bit of that but you know, at 20 it's hard to be as commanding as Johnny is and whether he has that drive look um, we're we are of course totally losing the run of ourselves because we're basically you do are. on one game at that level but I don't think he'll go I, but I can see a K. I can see Farrell considering it. I think he's too good not to consider it. They got to talk about it. Is, is this good? Yeah. Jeez. Yeah. Well, we'll see if he plays a, bit, a few more matches. Yeah. Okay. It's all potential now. Yeah. But last Saturday was very. That's impressive. one. That's one point on the graph. Yeah. Fair enough. We'd like a couple more. One last uh, question to you. It's more of a general one, but you can answer it through the prism of Prendergast because you have mentioned a few times Keith his calmness and his composure. That's something we associate with an older player. Yeah. What do you think? Is it intelligence? Is it a personality issue? What do you think imbues a young player in particular 
on his Leinster debut with Cam, he shouldn't have Cam and space around him. Yeah, I, I look, I don't know him. So um, you're kind of speculating from afar. But what I would say, in the 20s games in particular, the first 20s game he played, he had a very mixed 30 minutes. And uh, at the start, like really mixed. It was kind of you trying stuff and different things. And you have to then you have to adjust your own head and say, OK, this isn't the rugby that you're watching all the time. This is a, a group of guys that have been put together trying to play in a different style. So it's taking a bit of time. But he then took over in the second half. And he just seemed to have that sense of he'll make a decision he'll you know he'll pull a pass he'll he'll chip over the top he'll do whatever it is that he feels he wants to go and do he did it with a smile on his face and you say god he's wearing that fairly lightly that's nice i like i just i, I think it's a personality thing um but he's also big he's like we're just saying he's six three or six four so he's like that gives you great confidence he's a big he's a big guy um but I think he's got a lot of good skills and I think he still makes wrong decisions. He does all the things that, that lots of players do that are wrong, but he seems to be fairly unflappable. That I really like that. That's right, yeah. And he's also, he's, um, like, he stood up to getting smashed a couple of times. You know, so he's taking it to the line. It's... I've watched this for, for, for years. Now, now, this is mostly to do with tens and, well, am I talking about tens? But... The, the pressure that a 10 is under and the pressure that a 10 is under taking the ball to the line, knowing you're going to get hit either just before you release the ball or just after you release the ball. Um, it's natural for you to take a step further back and to, to delay that. You're looking at guys that are 20 stone. It's natural to 